Unthinkable, Book One of the Tate Pack Series. Dedication. To the love of my life, Daniel, I wrote this before I met you, before I realized that I was searching for my own soulmate, and before I realized that I'd find him in someone who despises twilight as much as you do. Te quiero mucho, my gorgeous Brit. Thank you to Katharina, Susie, Kat, Becky, Kate, Lucy, Sid, and Laura for supporting my writing and pushing me to keep writing more and more and more. You guys rock my face off. And to Thorny, my TTBB, and his jazz, Matt and his Brad for inspiring this skeptical army vet to believe in love again. I love you, boys. Only thing worse than a cowboy getting hitched to a city girl is him getting hitched to a cow. Or a New Yorker. Vernon Vet Tate Chapter 1 the first thing that Richard Tilson noticed were his hands. They were large, manicured, tanned hands. Gorgeous hands. Hands that were made to caress, made to thrust, made to turn another man on. All sorts of naughty ideas went rushing through his mind as he saw those hands coming towards him. He could almost imagine those same hands caressing him, holding him down, those long, wide fingers filling him before... He screamed when he was abruptly jarred out of his fantasy by those same hands grabbing him and pulling him out of the way of the big truck barreling down the road. He felt himself flying through the air, towards some unknown destination. Okay, so maybe he wasn't flying, but it felt like it, especially when he landed on something hard and then rolled onto something soft with something large and hard on top of him. I'm dead. I just know it. I'm dead, he heard his own breathless voice. You're not dead, I just knocked the wind out of you, he heard a deep southern voice say above him. That same voice chuckled softly, seconds after reassuring him. Hearing the tinge of amusement in the voice of his savior, he peeked open first one blue eye and then another, before his breath completely escaped him. It couldn't be possible. He was staring into the most amazingly beautiful clear green eyes that he'd ever seen in his life. Black hair fell forward onto the forehead of the larger man, his thin lips pulled back into a smile, his thin nose flared slightly as if he smelled something delicious. Richard felt like wrapping his arms and legs around the larger man, who appeared to be almost three times as large as his own five-foot-four-inch, 119 pounds frame. That was something very much out of character for him. He may be very open about his sexuality, he was a proud gay man, but a slut he was not. Although, if the stranger asked him to get naked and dance around Times Square, he'd do it in a heartbeat. As long as he promised to fuck him when the dance was over. He waited for the other man to rise off of him. He hoped that it would be quickly, especially with the gathering crowd asking if they were okay, and the not-so-subtle erection he had pressing against the front of his too tight low-rise jeans. He gasped as he felt a rumble in the larger man's chest, and he had to give himself a mental shake when he thought he heard the other man breathe the word, Mine. You ever plan on getting off of me there, cowboy? You know, so I can breathe? He asked flirtatiously, a little shocked at his own audacity, but feeling a little saucy while underneath the muscled stranger. Even though he might just get his ass kicked for coming on to the obviously straight man, I hadn't planned on it, but I guess if you gotta breathe to live, although I plan on having you underneath me soon. The larger man rose off of him and stretched out a hand to help him up. Richard rose gracefully with the man's help, two decades of dance training making themselves known. He smiled and nodded at the crowd of people that asked him if he were all right, his gaze continuously returning to his hero, who stood silently beside him, almost in front of him, as if protecting him from being touched by anyone else. When the last person finally left and walked away, having gone out of their way to check on him and now returning to the hustle and bustle of New York City life, Richard turned towards the other man, his eyes drifting up and up and up. He felt his face flush and swallowed deeply. Thank you for saving my life, he said shyly. The other man merely nodded, his gaze intense upon Richard's face. When a long minute passed without a word being spoken by either of them, Richard reached down and grabbed his bag, which had amazingly been saved in all of the chaos. You Richard Tilson, 
the other man asked as he pulled a picture out of his pocket along with an envelope. Richard froze and turned to face the other man. How did this man know his name? He didn't owe anyone any money, and he was talented, but he didn't think that the government was looking for him. He hadn't done anything illegal, and he had no family that would be looking for him. Realizing that it had to be for a totally different reason that the man in question knew his name and had a picture of him, along with an envelope, he nodded, unable to speak. Maybe he won the lottery. I was coming to your place when I saw you leave. Just kind of followed you, planned on talking to you, or at least introducing myself, when I saw you getting ready to cross the street with the car coming right at you, the other man explained, obviously seeing the fear in Richard's face. My name is Vernon Tate. You knew my baby sister, Amanda Lynn? Richard felt the fear lift off of him at the mention of his best friend, Amanda Lynn, whom he called Al, from college and graduate school. He smiled at the other man. So this was Al's older brother. He was hot. He stood at about six foot seven inches. He was all muscle on top of muscle, his neck thick like a linebacker, his skin tanned by the sun. He could remember Al telling him about the family farm down in Texas. That was probably how he got so tanned. Oh, my God! Yeah, your vet? Richard asked excitedly, his naturally bubbly personality shining through as he thought about his best friend. He sobered almost instantly. Al and her husband had passed a few weeks ago in some kind of weird hunting accident. Some hunters shot them when they mistook them for wolves. Richard had been on tour in Paris, and by the time the news had reached him, the funeral had already taken place. "'I'm so sorry for your loss,' he said compassionately. Vernon, or Vet, as Al called him, merely nodded, blinking away the moisture in his eyes. "'Um, so why were you looking for me?' he asked, as he led Vet over to the benches in the park. He sat down gently, feeling a little sore after his tumble with the other man a few minutes earlier. He crossed one leg over the other and smiled when Vet practically flopped onto the bench and his legs spread wide. I don't really know how to say this, but see Mandy, she and her husband, well, they thought quite a bit of you. They felt real bad that you had to miss the wedding but still stayed in contact, and she just gave birth to triplets. You know, a few months before the, uh, accident. And the lawyer said she left instructions for the care of the triplets. Vet paused here, his eyes locking onto Richard's as if imploring him to understand. Richard wasn't stupid by any stretch of the imagination. Contrary to what his father and brothers thought, he had an above-average IQ that wasn't diminished or negated because he was gay or because he danced for a living. Even with that, it took him a while to really grasp what Vet was saying. But when he did, he gasped. You have to be joking! Al and Cameron left their triplets to me? Why would they do that? I'm single, unmarried, gay, and I have a very successful career as a dancer. I mean, well, a somewhat successful career. I'm not working right now, but still. They lived in Texas, and Al said you both came from a very traditional, if slightly unusual, family. How are they going to feel about Al leaving her babies to me? And how am I supposed to support them? I'm all by myself. What was Al thinking? I can't. Richard's words were cut off abruptly when Vet leaned forward and took his lips in a hard and passionate kiss that fried his brain. Everything faded away. The ever-present sounds of New York became a soft, buzzing noise. The bench he sat on became as comfortable as though he were sitting on his king-sized bed and he felt as if he were floating and weighted down simultaneously. After a few minutes, when air was essential for them both, the two men pulled away from each other. Richard stared at Vet in shock, his blue eyes dark with desire. They left the triplets to you because they trusted you. Both sets of parents are dead. They left money, a house, cars, a college trust fund for all three babies, everything you could possibly need. They left it for you. They trusted you. Besides, you really only have partial custody. Vet smirked at the look of trepidation that crossed Richard's face. Who am I sharing custody with? he asked, although he suspected he knew the answer. Well, that's why I'm here. You're sharing custody with me, and I came here to fetch you and bring you back to Texas to help me raise, well, our children. Chapter 2 Vet didn't spend much of his life smiling. There just wasn't much in his life to smile about. 
His parents had died when he was barely eighteen, leaving him in charge of his sister Amanda, the head of their family, and with his father's death he'd been named Alpha by default. It wasn't something that had shocked him too much. He'd always been made aware that he would be Alpha one day, unless someone challenged him for the role and he lost. The timing was just wrong. Vet had just met the greatest guy, Michael. Michael was tall, thin, with a firm ass and pouty lips, and Vet had fallen instantly in love with him. The two of them had had to sneak around, not because Vet's family wouldn't understand about him being gay, although that's what he'd told Michael. It was because he was a shifter, and Michael wasn't. Vet had grown up knowing he was a wolf shifter, what it meant, and the proud heritage of his people, and how important it was for him to keep that part of himself a secret from everyone but other shifters and his mate his mate. Vet looked at Richard, where the man paced back and forth from his bedroom to the living room of his tiny New York apartment, packing, muttering, and protesting going to Texas. Vet had never smelled anything as delicious as the smell of his mate. Richard smelled like burning wood, baked apples, and melted caramel, his favorite candy. When he'd first began following the smaller man, he hadn't been able to detect his scent, his nostrils filled with the stench of New York City. How could anyone stand all of the noise and the smell of broken dreams, despair, and garbage? He asked himself for the fifth time. The instant he'd rescued Richard, however, the younger man's scent had wrapped around him like the softest blanket, making him feel at home, making him want to rub against the smaller man and mingle their scents together. He'd also wanted to make love to him and mark him so everyone knew who he belonged to. He sighed as the man in question stepped back out of his bedroom, nibbling on his bottom lip. He was about to protest again, and Vet was actually considering knocking the other man out and whisking him back to Texas. I'm not sure this is a good idea. I mean, I'm supposed to just drop everything and move to Texas? Texas? They kill men like me in Texas. Besides, I have a life here, and I'm not really sure that I'd make such a good parent. I mean, I'm kind of high-maintenance, you know? Self-centered? I only think about myself. These babies will be better off if you raise them alone. Do I need to sign something? I'll give you everything. Richard's words cut off when Vet stood up and approached him. He'd heard enough. The younger man was going to worry himself sick with all of the accepting and denying, packing and unpacking. I don't believe any of that for one second. There's no way Mandy would have stayed friends with you if you were selfish and self-centered. Yeah, you might be high maintenance, but then so was Mandy, and we got along right nice. Besides, I work all the time. I ain't really got the time to be a single parent. Got a bunch of folks counting on me to look out for them, and I take my responsibilities seriously. And we got gays in Texas. I'm gay, been gay all my life, and ain't nothing happened to me yet. Now, you just stop looking for ways to be wrong for those babies. They depended on both of us to care for them. So was Mandy, or she would have never left them to us. You'll be fine. The babies will be fine. I'll be fine. We'll all be fine. You just come, and we'll try it for six months. If and you still can't do it, well, I guess we'll worry about it then. Vet offered, ignoring the voice in his head that told him that he'd never let Richard go. The man was his mate, created by the fates just for him. They were destined to be together, and they would be just as soon as Vet could convince Richard to get on a plane for Texas. Then he'd tell him about shifters and mates, and they'd be mated and raise the babies together and live happily ever after. Easy as apple pie. He shrugged off the feeling that things would never be as easy as he was trying to make it seem. He smiled as Richard's blonde head nodded in agreement, his eyes still filled with uncertainty, his teeth still nibbling on that full bottom lip that he couldn't wait to suck on or feel wrapped around his cock, and he bit back a moan. It wouldn't do him any good to scare off the jittery man with his overzealous hormones, but his wolf wanted its mate, and he was having a hard time not picking up the smaller man, stripping him of all his clothes, and fucking him up against the wall, just to take the edge off. Then he'd lower him to the floor, flip him onto his stomach, and lick and suck and fuck his ass with his tongue. He'd smile at the sound of the younger man's moans and gasps of pleasure. Then, when Richard was clawing at the carpet, he'd push his large cock deep within him and fuck him until they both couldn't move or speak. Vet? The sound of his name pulled him out of his erotic musings, and he looked down at the other man, focusing on his face, the desire in his eyes slowly receding. 
Yeah, he replied, smirking when his nose detected the faint smell of the other man's arousal. So his little man was turned on too, huh? Maybe this whole mating thing wouldn't be that hard after all. Where exactly are the triplets right now? You didn't leave them by themselves, did you? Richard asked, a small note of panic creeping into his voice. Vet bit his lip to keep from grinning. Yep, even for all of his bluster and denials, Richard was going to be a great parent. Nah, got an aunt who moved to Connecticut with her mate, er, her husband, and they met me here in the city. Got him watching the babies in a hotel. He stated as he closed the fifth and final suitcase that Richard had placed near the door. For a man who had no plans on leaving his home forever, Vet noticed that Richard hadn't left anything behind, except the furniture, which he wouldn't need anyway. Reckon we better get going. We gotta pick up the triplets and get to the airport. Richard nodded his head but didn't move. His eyes darted around the room, never staying on one item for long, not making a sound. Vet could detect a small tactic better than the next man. Sending the air, he picked up the lingering smell of Richard's arousal his fear, his denial, and his excitement? Could it be that Richard wanted to come to Texas to raise Amanda and Cameron's kids? It would certainly seem so. Vet knew then that Richard needed to have his options taken from him, at least in this matter. Make it so that the smaller man wouldn't have to think at all. Just follow and do what he was told. He was sure that the other man wouldn't always be so accommodating, but for now he needed the firm hand of an alpha to guide him. It made him the perfect mate. It made him Vet's perfect mate. All righty then. Grab your bags, baby. Let's go get our kids from the Hilton and fly on to Texas, he commanded his mate, grinning when the other man moved forward to do so without another word or thought. He hadn't even noticed the term of endearment that Vet had snuck into the command. Vet chuckled softly and shrugged his shoulders as he lifted up the rest of the bags, stepping out of the now almost bare apartment walking the bags down to the large rental black SUV that he'd left waiting in front of Richard's Manhattan apartment. He knew enough about New York real estate to know that if Richard was able to afford an apartment in Manhattan, then his dancing career paid him very well. He also knew enough about body language and human psychology to know that Richard wasn't as happy as he projected himself to be. He would make his mate happy. They would raise Amanda's children as if they were their own, and he would spend the rest of his days trying to make his little mate, with his long blonde hair that fell to his shoulders, big crystal blue eyes, pouty lips, thin nose, and thin but toned frame, happy. He always succeeded when he put his mind to it, and he wasn't about to fail now. He had too much to lose, if he did. Chapter 3 I'm not crazy. I am crazy. I have to be crazy. Why the hell am I doing this? Oh yeah, because I'm crazy. Richard's inner monologue was going to actually drive him crazy if he didn't calm down. Wiping his hands on his jeans, he slid his gaze over towards Vet's profile. How could the other man be so calm about all of this? Did he often fly halfway across the country to give people shared custody of newborns whose parents had died and then pack them up to move them back to Texas with him? Maybe that's why he said he had an unusual family. Maybe they're like a cult or something, he thought irrationally. He grunted. He knew that he was being silly now. He'd known Al for years, and she'd never given off the vibe that she had been raised in a cult. She and Cameron seemed completely normal. So why was it that being around Vet, talking with him, Packing up to move with him just felt so right, especially since it was so weird. Maybe it's because it doesn't feel weird to you at all. You feel like you've been waiting your whole life to meet this guy, and now you're trying to talk yourself out of it. He already gave you a way out, and you know Al, this is just her style, leaving her children with you and letting you find out when you didn't have a way to argue back with her, Richard reasoned with himself. He scoffed mentally at his musings. He sounded like one of those mushy, hopelessly romantic, helpless characters in one of those romance books that Al was always reading. Yeah, right. Who would write a romance book about gay men anyway? Here we are. Vet's deep, smooth-as-melted chocolate voice yanked him out of his musings and soothed his racing thoughts as well. How do you do that? he asked without thinking. He watched as Vet pulled the key out of the ignition and, after unbuckling his seatbelt, turned to face him. Do what? 
he questioned, dark bushy eyebrows raised in amazement, then lowered in confusion, and Richard wanted to scream that he watched their movement with fascination. He was sick. No, he was horny, and he needed to get laid, like yesterday. I don't know. Talk, he responded, not making any sense. He watched Vet's eyebrows lower further, as if in complete consternation, before he burst into deep, rumbling laughter. Richard watched as the older man's mouth opened, and he laughed with his entire being and his heart caught in his chest. Were those dimples in his cheeks? He groaned. Someone in heaven was laughing at him, wanting to see him squirm. Well, like most people, I open my mouth, think words, and they come out of my voice box. Same as you. Vet responded in amusement, chuckling again when Richard huffed in annoyance. You know what I mean. You talk, and I don't know. I feel peaceful, like someone's wrapping me in a blanket. How do you do that? Is that some sort of southern hospitality magic kind of thing? Vet's body became rigid then, and Richard's eyebrows rose at the reaction to his questions. What had he said to make the big man act in such a way? Do you believe in that stuff? Vet asked, trying for a nonchalant tone. What stuff? Richard asked as the two men finally exited the vehicle and walked into the posh hotel and made their way towards the elevator. Vet didn't respond at first, his face set in an impassive mask, his lips set in a grim line. If Richard didn't know better, he'd think that the other man was nervous about something. There was only one other couple in the elevator when they stepped on, a young couple who couldn't seem to keep their hands off of each other. Richard tried to look away, but his eyes kept returning to their passionate kisses and bold caresses of each other. Is that normal? He heard Vet ask from where he stood behind him, his voice sounding strained, and Richard wondered if the large Texan was as turned on by the other couple as he was. For New York? Yeah, it actually is, he responded, grinning widely when their voices finally carried over to the other couple, who froze, and, as if slowly becoming aware of their surroundings and the fact that they were in a public place, they separated and grinned sheepishly at them. Sorry, the smaller man, a gorgeous little blonde, said. We just found out that they legalized gay marriage in our home state. Richard nodded with a grin. He'd reacted much the same way when New York had done it except he couldn't remember the name of the man he'd had sex with to celebrate that night. These two looked as if they were in it for the long haul. Are you two planning on getting married, then? Vet asked politely as the elevator doors opened and the other couple prepared to step out. Well, we've been together for years, adopted a son, had a daughter by surrogate. We're already a family and tell people that we're married, but yeah, we're going to make it official just as soon as we can pack and fly back home. The larger man, dark-haired, with a Stetson on his head, replied. Richard laughed silently. It was like looking at mirror images of him and Vet almost. Well, except for the fact that the other couple was in a committed relationship. That's really great. Where's home for you? Richard asked, hoping that the two didn't mind that they were holding them up from leaving. Ohio, the two men answered simultaneously, before they both burst into laughter. It was the happiest sound that Richard had ever heard. Oh, honey, we have to go call V. She promised to perform our wedding when it was legal, the smaller man replied. Well, let's go call her then, the larger man responded. Right then a phone rang and both men chuckled. That's probably her. Nice to meet you, the blonde answered, and the two men stepped out of the elevator completely and walked away, chattering happily with their friend over the phone and planning their wedding. I'm so happy for them, Richard responded quietly to Vet, his mind imagining his own non-existent, improbable wedding and marriage. Yeah, me too. He heard Vet sigh behind him, and he turned to look at the larger man as the elevator continued to move up to their floor. So, what stuff? he asked again, picking up their conversation from the car. Oh, yeah, you know, like magic and shapeshifters and stuff, Vet responded, the tension returning to his body. Richard considered the question. He wasn't sure why the other man was asking him such an absurd question. Was he trying to prove that he was unfit to raise Al's children? Well, no, it couldn't be that. He'd talked Richard into coming. Why would he be trying to talk him out of it now? Maybe he meant it as a joke. Richard shook his head mentally. That didn't really seem the type to joke around like normal people. Deciding to take the question at face value, he decided to answer honestly. Yeah, I guess I do kind of believe that stuff. There are too many things that can't be explained. Besides, it would be the height of arrogance for humans to believe that we're so special, we're the only species around that can talk. 
I mean, if we can't discount aliens, then we can't discount werewolves or shapeshifters or wizards and witches. Besides, Jacob Black from the Twilight series is hot, Richard responded with a smile. Vett laughed and nodded, the tension easing from his body as if Richard's response had eased his mind of some unspoken worry. Before Richard could ask the other man about it, however, the doors opened to the penthouse suite, and Richard followed the larger man through the entryway into the living area of the suite. He'd been a little shocked that Vett had the money and the reputation to have a penthouse suite in the hotel, but he hadn't questioned him. How would he know how much money one could make as a farmer and a cowboy? Maybe they made a lot. Ridding his mind of the image of Vet in a pair of brown leather chaps and a Stetson, much like the one the man had in the elevator, his muscles rippling and sweaty from working outside all day, Richard tried to desperately think of anything that would make his erection dwindle. Acne, bunions, my grandmother naked, my parents having sex, wearing clothes completely out of season. That last thought was so absurd that he gave a snort of laughter and realized that his erection had died somewhere along the way. Waving his hand at Vet's look of question, he pasted a smile on his face as he stepped fully into the room and smiled at the couple sitting on the couch before turning to look at the babies, two of them sleeping in their carriers, while one stared right at him from his. Richard felt his heart catch in his chest and lost it at that moment to those triplets. There was no way he could walk away now. I guess I'm going to be a cowboy now. Chapter 4 Vet watched Richard walk towards the triplets with a small smile on his face. He had been hoping for a reaction of caring from the smaller man, but the expression of wonder and instant caring was more than he could have ever hoped for. Looking over at his aunt, a tall, robust woman with black hair that fell to her waist, ample bosom and dancing green eyes, the two of them shared a look. He knew that she would be cornering him to ask about Richard sooner or later, and he would be ready for her but not at that moment. He stepped forward to stand beside Richard, where he stood before the triplets. Let me introduce you. This is Amy, Kurt, and... He looked over at Richard, who stood staring at the triplets, his eyes fastened on the baby boy who was still awake, wanting to see his reaction when he said his name. Richard, Jr. We call him R.J., though. He saw Richard's eyes widen and his mouth drop open in shock before he turned to slowly look at him. Al named one of her babies after me? The smaller man whispered, his eyes filling with tears that he quickly blinked away. Vet merely smiled and nodded his head. Why? Richard asked, looking back at the babies again. Vet shrugged before responding. I reckon it's because you were a friend of hers, or because, as she said, you were the reason she was at that store where she met Cameron and she wouldn't have him if it weren't for you. Mandy had never explained what she meant by that and Vet had never asked, but he was curious about it and wanted to know. He saw Richard smile softly at the memory and quirked an eyebrow. Al and I had gone to this party, gotten really drunk, and stumbled back to our apartment in Brooklyn. I got really sick, and we didn't have any ginger ale in the house. I begged and cried for her to go get me some. I'd never been that sick from drinking before. Well, she went, and she met Cameron at the store. He came back with her, and after they gave me the ginger ale and some aspirin, they went back to her room and they f— Richard stopped talking abruptly, his face flaming red as he sheepishly grinned at Vet. Vet chuckled. He could understand what happened even if Richard hadn't continued. Cameron was a wolf shifter, just like Mandy, so they both understood about mating and the mating heat. Even though Vet felt it like an itch that could never be scratched, a throbbing erection that would never be satisfied, Richard was a human who didn't know about wolf shifters or mates, and Vet knew he had to tread lightly. It sucked. Well, nothing was sucking at that point, but it was really bad. Giving himself a mental shake, Vet turned towards his aunt and her mate. Richard, this is my aunt Tricia and her mate, her husband David. Vet introduced them, nodding at David, a large bear of a man. His size was practically overwhelming, but that was probably because David was a bear shifter. His shaggy brown hair, coupled with his hairy face and body, gave him the look of a bear posing as a human. But Vet knew he was a teddy bear. Auntie, David, this here is Richard, Mandy's best friend, the baby's new guardian, and my... He merely lifted his eyebrows, hoping that they would catch on to what he wasn't saying. When they both nodded, he knew they understood, and when Richard turned to look at him with surprise and confusion in his eyes, he finished his statement. 
my co-parent, and hopefully new friend as well. Richard smiled sweetly at him before shaking hands with Tricia and David. It's very nice to meet you, Richard stated before turning back to the babies. That I think if we're going to go, we should go now, he said almost apologetically. Yeah, we kind of figured, so we already got all your stuff packed up and ready to go. We'll do the checkout for you. You kids go ahead and get going to the airport, Trisha said with another sweet smile at Richard. That was surprised. He was certain she was going to corner him to interrogate him about his new mate. But she was just letting them go. Not just letting, encouraging them to go. Damn near pushing them out of the room. What was with her? Nodding his head at his aunt, making a mental note to call her later, Vet reached out to grab the carriers for two of the babies. He smiled as Richard picked up the last carrier that held his namesake before walking over to pick up some of the bags on the floor. He stood nibbling on his bottom lip, seeming to be in deep concentration. "'What you thinking about over there?' Vet asked, his southern drawl becoming more pronounced as he felt himself growing aroused. This was not the best time for it. He was holding two babies, for heaven's sake. How the hell are we supposed to get all of this shit downstairs? Richard asked in exasperation. He sounded so adorable and flustered that Vet and his aunt and uncle all laughed. Vet gestured for Richard to go ahead of him. We make a couple of trips, but don't worry. When we get to the airport, we'll add your shit, and then it'll really be interesting. He ignored Richard's glare as he chuckled and led the smaller man over to the elevators. He couldn't help feeling as if he were forgetting something and he continuously looked behind him, but seeing nothing, he shrugged and entered the elevator behind his mate. Richard sighed as he sat down in the waiting area of Terminal 41 in the LaGuardia Airport in Newark, New Jersey. He was exhausted. It took them an hour and a half to get through security because of all of the baby carriers. Then Kurt woke up screaming, which woke up Amy and set off her own brand of screaming. It had taken him and Vet thirty minutes to calm them down, and while the babies were still awake, they were now happily sucking on their pacifiers and kicking their legs in happiness. Our daughter is the same way. She screams for a few minutes and then settles down happily as if nothing were ever wrong. Richard looked up at the voice speaking to him and realized that it was the short blonde from the elevator at the hotel earlier. Hi, nice to see you again. He smiled at the other man as he sat down across from him, holding out a picture towards him. Richard took the offered picture and smiled at the image. It was of the two men and the two children. One, a young boy of two or three with brown hair, hazel eyes, and a shy smile. The young blonde man was holding a baby in his arms, the little girl grinning straight at the camera as if ready to take on the world. They are beautiful, he smiled. He watched as the other man's eyes softened as he took back the picture. Yes, they are, he said with a happy smile, before looking back at him and offering his hand. My name's Thorny. My husband's name is Jazz. He gestured at the larger man, who was walking back with a large vet, holding an awake Kurt in his arms, and two bottles of Coke in his free hand. Nice to officially meet you. My name is Richard, and this is Vernon, but everyone calls him Vet. Richard gestured to Vet, who sat next to him, moving Kurt's empty carrier to the floor, Amy held in Richard's arms, and R.J. content to lay in his carrier next to Richard, playing with the lights on the ceiling. Do they call you vet because you're a veterinarian? Thorny asked with a shy smile, full of love at his husband Jazz when the other man handed him a bottle of juice. No, nah, name's Vernon Tate. My baby sister, Mandy, couldn't say Vernon. One day I got in trouble and my mama said my whole name. Well, Mandy tried to imitate her and said vet instead. Name just kind of stuck, I guess. Vet offered with a grin. Richard nodded. He'd heard the story from Al when they were in college, when he'd asked how her brother had gotten the nickname as well. He smiled at the consideration that Jazz seemed to offer Thorny, the gentle care and his air of protectiveness. Richard wanted that for himself and hoped that one day he would find someone who wanted to care for him as much as he'd want to love them. Without warning, his eyes slid over to Vet. They hadn't talked about the kiss they'd shared in the park, and he could only hope that it wasn't a fluke. Maybe the gorgeous cowboy could actually want him one day? She told me later on that she had been thinking about admitting herself into one of those assisted living hospices, you know, for, like, disabled people, because she felt like she was being a burden on her family and she didn't really have anyone to talk to. She said she was starting to become depressed. I didn't think anything of it, but she said she read a blog post of mine that inspired and uplifted her to not only accept who she was, who she'd become after this injury, but to make her situation better. I wrote her back to thank her for thanking me, and we've been talking ever since. 
She's a published author now and dedicated two of her book series to me and Jazz. We felt really honored, especially when she said she'd perform our wedding, Richard heard Thorny saying, before the small blonde blushed and ducked his head shyly. You'll have to excuse Thorny. He's not usually so talkative. He's actually the shy one. But if you ask him about V or our kids or our family, and well, he just sort of lights up. Jazz replied with an indulgent smile at his partner before kissing the smaller man on his temple. Your friend V, the one you called on the phone, she said that to you? Richard clarified. Thorny nodded. She's a disabled vet, was in the army for a while. She encouraged me and Jazz to come to New York this weekend, said she had a good feeling. She even paid for our tickets, said it was her way of saying thank you. Richard watched as the blonde shrugged. I don't think I really did anything, but she said I'd never really understand how special I was. Ain't that the truth? Jazz agreed with a grin, and the two men shared a sweet kiss before breaking apart with a smile. Richard turned to Vet, and the two men found themselves locked in a heated gaze. He couldn't understand his reaction to the cowboy. He wanted to drag him off to the nearest room, strip off all of their clothes, and have him fuck him so hard he couldn't walk for the next week. An announcement over the PA system snapped them out of their reverie, and they both cleared their throats and smiled over at Thorny and Jazz, who were standing up preparing to leave. I remember when Jazz and I used to get lost in each other's eyes like that. Thorny smiled happily. We still do, honey. When you have a connection like us, a deep love like ours, that never goes away. Jazz reminded him, before with a wave and placing his hand on Thorny's lower back, he led the smaller man towards their plane. I want that, Richard sighed dreamily, not really speaking to Vet, but needing to put out the desire into the universe. I believe that you'll have that. In fact, I know you will, he heard Vet state, the Texan's deep voice caressing his body and leaving goosebumps and shivers of delight behind. Richard turned to look at the other man, and although he couldn't be sure, he thought he could hear the unspoken end to his statement. I believe that you'll have that. In fact, I know you will. With me. Chapter 5 Richard cringed as Amy began crying in Vet's arms again, and sighed as he looked over at the man directly across the hall from him. Do you need me to take her again? He asked, his tone sympathetic and slightly pleading. He'd become one of those people, the kind that brought their sobbing, bawling, miserable babies on board an airplane and made everyone else suffer because of it. Giving the passengers all behind him a sheepish and apologetic look, he checked to be sure that Kurt and R.J. were still asleep. They were, before standing up and walking across the aisle to take a squirming, crying Amy from her uncle's arms. We should have drove, Vet mumbled for the eighth time. You don't think I wish we were a little farther into this trip? That maybe the trip was already over, or better yet, wasn't even a necessity? I do. With all my work, with the babies, and dealing with you so far, I totally understand. But if we had driven, we would have been on the road for a week, Richard pointed out before he sat back down. Not true. We could have been there in three days, that pointed out. Staying in hotels? Really? Richard questioned him. He rocked Amy gently in his arms, smiling when the infant began to calm down. What's wrong with staying in hotels? That asked petulantly. Richard grinned at the pouty look on the big man's face, so out of character with his stature that he almost laughed. Staying in hotels is fun when kids are older or when it's just the parents, but having infants in a hotel? Especially when you're traveling? It doesn't sound like fun to me, Richard stated with a shrug, before noticing that Amy had finally fallen asleep. You're really good with him, Vet smiled. Richard merely blushed before standing carefully to put the baby back in her carrier. Taking out a pair of earplugs, he gently placed them in her ears before placing a pacifier in her mouth which she began to suck on in her sleep instantly. Turning to repeat the process with Kurt and R.J., he found his hand grabbed by Vet, and he stopped. Turning to look at the other man, his eyes widened at the desire burning in his green eyes. Letting his eyes drift down, he saw the very large erection straining against the front of Vet's wranglers, and felt his own erection surging in his designer jeans. You, uh, you wanted something? he asked in a choked voice. Vet opened his mouth to respond when the fastened seatbelt sign flashed and the pilot began speaking, 
Richard heard Vet growl softly in frustration and felt his mouth pull up in a small smile. When Vet released his hand, he leaned forward and quickly kissed him before returning to his seat between Kurt and R.J., who were blessedly still asleep. Quickly putting in their earplugs and pacifiers, he fastened his seatbelt and sat back with a sigh. What was it about Vet? He always had the urge to curl up in his lap and rub himself all over the other man, or to rip off his clothes, spread his legs, and beg the bigger man to fuck him six ways from Sunday. Or, most embarrassingly, he wanted to tilt his head to the side and beg the other man to bite him. He'd never been into BDSM or S&M or whatever it was that Rihanna was singing about, so he had no idea where the urge to be bitten came from. Giving himself another mental shake to prepare himself for landing, he glanced over at the man in question only to find Vet's eyes fastened on him. He smiled weakly at him, feeling as if he were being undressed with Vet's eyes and wishing he knew what the other man was thinking. Vet groaned as he smelled Richard's arousal hanging heavily in the close confines of his Ford expedition. They had been able to grab the triplets, a luggage rack, and get to where he'd parked his expo with minimum fuss. As soon as they'd settled in the car, however, he'd smelled Richard's arousal and felt himself fighting his wolf for dominance. He felt his canines trying to extend, his body struggling to grow bigger and his hair beginning to grow longer and thicker in some places and he inhaled to calm his racing heart. Which was a bad idea, of course, because with that inhale the smell of Richard's cloying arousal pulsed through his body. This time he couldn't hold back the growl in his throat. He saw Richard's gaze fly towards his, and he responded, "'You're killing me here, babe, with all your wanting me and being all turned on and shit,' he explained, reaching down to try to give himself some room in his jeans, although there was none to be had. All shifters were well endowed, but he was still bigger than most, and for that reason he often had to buy larger-sized jeans and wear a belt, just so he wouldn't feel choked all day. But to be trying to drive, in his Wranglers, hard and getting harder? Well, it was damn near becoming a fucking magic trick. How did you know I was... Richard questioned, not finishing the question. Vet sighed. He could give some flip answer, but his mama had always taught him that you don't lie to your mate, even if it would be in their best interest. Turning onto the long dirt driveway that led to his family ranch and working farm, filled with acres of wild forest, left there for the members of the pack to be able to run and hunt. Vet didn't answer as he pulled up in front of the home his parents had left for Mandy after he'd insisted that he'd stay in the bachelor house he'd built for himself that sat a ways behind the main house the Alpha House. He tried to see the home through Richard's eyes, and could see why the New Yorker sat with his mouth open. All of the properties in New York were tiny, but cost a lot of money. Real estate in Texas was more of the bigger-is-better variety, and so while everything in Texas was actually bigger than just about anything in New York, the cost was actually cheaper. His home rose three stories from the ground, boasted of six bedrooms in addition to the master suite a nursery a library an office family room gourmet kitchen formal dining room breakfast nook outdoor pool greenhouse out back with a vegetable garden that his mother had started and mandy had continued they had a very large working ranch where he raised and bred horses getting them ready for rodeos and competitions they also had cattle sheep and goats on their farm, which none of the pack ever hunted, knowing that the animals helped to bring in money for them. Oh. My. God. I'm going to be living here? Richard breathed, and Vet smiled, not answering before turning off the vehicle and climbing from the car. He walked towards the back, opened the door, and after unbuckling them, lifted up the carriers that held Kurt and R.J., deciding to stick with the boys as he carried them towards the house. He heard Richard following him, and smiled at the sounds of awe and wonder the smaller man made as he walked up towards the large, white clapboard home. This used to be a plantation, you know, a long time ago. When the Civil War broke out, though, the slaves were freed by this mysterious group of people who drove off the slave owners and gave the slaves their freedom. A lot of them stayed, some of them moved north, some of them stayed in town. But this land has been a part of my family ever since. Vet gave Richard the history as he finally opened the door and led the smaller man inside. He heard the other man gasp again as he saw the large entryway. There was a large wolf image imprint on the floor, put there when his father was still alive. 
As they walked through the house, heading towards the nursery, he pointed out each room to his mate. Each room had a different theme and was painted in a different color. As a kid, he'd found it all fascinating. As an adult, he found it just a little scary. Your parents couldn't decide on one color? He heard Richard ask, and he laughed. My grandparents did this. My parents just kept it the way it was, so did Mandy. You could change it if you want. He heard Richard grunt and wondered at the sound. Walking up the stairs and turning right at the top, he pointed out the other bedrooms, letting Richard know that while no one lived there currently, they were sometimes used by his close friends and employees when they'd been working late, unsure of how to explain beta and gamma guards to the smaller man. Walking up the second flight of stairs, he led his mate to the nursery and walked inside the bright yellow room. Gah! He heard Richard yelp and chuckled. His grandmother had really liked bright colors, and the yellow was so bright it was almost neon. I had nightmares of this room as a kid, he laughed, picking up Kurt and placing the sleeping baby in his crib before taking out his earplugs and covering him with a light sheet. I bet you did. I think I will, too, he heard Richard say as he picked up R.J. to repeat the process with him. All three sleeping babies settled. He grabbed his mate's hand, and after turning on the baby monitors and security cameras, he walked down the hall towards the master suite. You've got some really high-tech security going on in the nursery there. Are there a lot of people out to kill wealthy cowboys out here in these parts? Richard teased. Vet merely pulled the smaller man into the bedroom before shutting the door and pushing the other man up against it, his hands on either side of the younger man's head as he bent low to speak into his upturned face. Only when you're as important as me. We had someone attempt something right after the triplets were born. We've had to take extra precaution now, he said before capturing his mate's mouth with his own. Richard's taste burst across his tongue, and he growled low in his throat again. His wolf wanted its mate. Now. And if he didn't do something fast, he was going to do something he'd regret later. Like mate Richard without his permission. He felt the smaller man's hips thrust against his own and felt his erection rubbing against his aching one, and he knew that the time was now or never. With a teasing nip to the other man's full bottom lip, he pulled away slightly, grinning at Richard's whimper of protest and resisting his clutching hands. I want you, Richard, he started. And you can have me right now, so let's go, he heard the other man's breathless voice. Vet merely grinned and shook his head, placing a finger on Richard's lips before taking a small step back. You need to know something first before you decide if you still want me or not, he explained, before he began to strip off his clothes. Not that I'm not enjoying this, but what do you have to tell me that involves you taking off your clothes? I know you're not a woman, I felt your dick grow hard against me, so that's not it, and I can tell it's not small, so what is it? Richard asked curiously. Vet merely continued undressing, sitting on the edge of the bed to pull off his boots, socks, jeans, and then his boxers. He stood before Richard completely nude and completely aroused. Good God Almighty, he heard Richard breathe, and he smiled in spite of the seriousness of what he had to say. He watched as Richard stepped forward slowly, as if in a trance, before sinking to his knees before him. You can tell me later he said before sticking out his tongue to lick up the liquid that had collected at the end of his engorged shaft. Vet growled again, his body shaking, before he felt his canines lengthen, his hair growing thicker and longer and his cock growing in size. He looked down at his mate, on his knees in a position of submission, and knew that he wouldn't be able to stop the change from taking over him this time. He needed to claim his mate, and he needed to do it now. Oh, my God, is your dick getting bigger? He heard Richard exclaim in shock and happiness. He never would have thought his mate was a size queen, but apparently he was. Listen, Richard, he spoke, his words slightly slurred because of his elongated teeth. I'm not like other men. Obviously, Richard agreed, his eyes still fastened on Vet's still growing erection. Oh, we're going to need a lot of lube and a lot of stretching if you plan on fitting that thing inside of me, the smaller man teased. Vet groaned at the image, and reaching down to grab Richard by the shoulders, he lifted him up so he could look into the man's face. He knew what he looked like. His canines had extended, his hair had grown to just past his shoulders. His chest was broader, more heavily muscled, and soft hair covered it lightly, 
His normally ten-inch cock was now around eleven and a half inches, and had grown thicker as well. His hands had grown, and he had to watch his nails that had lengthened and strengthened into claws. Vet, what the fuck? You look like a wolf man! Richard breathed, and Vet sniffed the air, scenting his slight fear. His curiosity, and amazingly, his arousal was still there. That's what I've been trying to tell you. I'm a wolf shifter. Hollywood calls us werewolves, but we're shapeshifters. We ain't bound by the moon. We can shift at will into our wolf forms, or into our half-wolf, half-man forms, like you see. But we only shift into this third form when we're fighting a challenge, or when we're about to claim our mates, he explained. He saw Richard's eyes widen. M mates What's that? He grinned wolfishly at Richard's question, before lowering his head and inhaling the scent of his mate. His wolf howled in pleasure within him, and he rubbed his face in the crook of the man's neck before lifting his head to answer. Wolves mate for life. Wolf shifters are the same. Fate has one person, sometimes two, that is created just for us. We know them by their scent. When we find that person or persons, we feel the urge to claim them, to make love to them, and to bite them. Here he said, pointing to the very spot he'd nuzzled earlier as he sat back down on the bed and pulled Richard down to sit on his lap. When we bite them, we mark them so that everyone knows that they belong to us, that they are claimed, that they are mated. So when I mark you, everyone will know that you belong to me, the Alpha of the Tate Pack. Richard moaned and tilted his head back, and Vet wondered if it was a conscious movement or not. Deciding not to overanalyze it, he licked the spot where Richard's neck joined his shoulder, and then lightly grazed his canines over the spot. He felt Richard shudder, and no longer willing to wait, he used one nail to tear into Richard's clothes before yanking them from the younger man's body. He swung the smaller man up onto the bed and pulled off the high-end boots the other man wore, before pulling off his socks, leaving him blissfully naked and throbbing. I'm your mate, he heard Richard's breathless voice. Yeah, and now I'm going to claim you, mark you, and fuck you until you pass out. Vet promised before leaning over to take his mate's leaking cock into his mouth. He had to taste him. The taste of his mate flooded his tongue and surrounded his senses. He heard Richard moan loudly and felt his hips surge forward as he tried to shove his dick into Vet's throat. He chuckled and held down the smaller man's hips. Swirling his tongue around the head of the other man's throbbing erection, he dragged his tongue down one side before licking up the other side, pushing lightly on the vein he felt throbbing there. He stuck his tongue into the slit at the tip of the smaller man's erection, savoring his flavor on his tongue before he kissed his way up his body to his puckered pink nipples. He moaned in appreciation at the sight before taking one into his mouth. He licked and sucked on the hardened tip, the fingers of his left hand plucking and squeezing the right nipple so that it didn't feel abandoned. Biting gently on the nipple in his mouth, he heard Richard pant his name and plead with him to just do it already. He shook his head before kissing and licking his way across his mate's toned chest to the other nipple, raising his right hand to the other wet tip as he repeated the process. He tortured the hardened tips until he felt his mate's body trembling beneath him. Raising his head, he moved up before he lowered his lips down onto the other man's opened mouth. Their tongues tangled together their breathing harsh with want and desire. He felt Richard's arms wrap around his neck and his legs wrap around his hips, and groaned as the tip of his own throbbing erection rubbed against the clenching, puckered entrance of his mate. Vet, please, I want you inside of me now, he heard Richard's voice, laced with desire, reach down and grip his cock in its embrace. I wanted to take my time and make it good for you, he panted, groaning when Richard lifted his hips. Take your time next time, but this time I want you to fuck me and I want you to do it now. Richard grinned. It seemed as if his mate was going to be a bossy bottom, rather than the submissive man he'd thought him to be. It turned him on even more. No longer able to constrain himself, he reached over to jerk open the top drawer of the nightstand and yanked out the bottle of lube he'd put there when he'd had to move in after Mandy's death. Shoving out thoughts of his dead sister and her mate, he sat back on his knees and opened the cap on the bottle of lubricant. Pouring some on his fingers, he almost dropped the bottle when he saw Richard grab hold of his own erection and begin to stroke. He watched for a moment, his tongue coming out to lick his lips as he remembered the taste of the younger man, before he slapped away the other man's hand. 
Mine, he growled before taking one looped finger and circling around the smaller man's puckered entrance. Both men groaned simultaneously, and Vet grabbed one firm cheek and squeezed it gently before slowly pushing in one finger. The velvet heat of his mate, clenching his finger, the tightness that surrounded his digit, made him whimper and almost lose his firm hold on his wool. He had to hurry up and prepare and stretch his mate, or he was going to embarrass himself and come all over the sheets before he even got a chance to be inside of him. Slowly thrusting his finger inside Richard's hole, he waited until he felt his entrance relax some before he pulled his finger almost all the way out and then pressed two inside. Hurry up, vet, please, he heard Richard plead, the younger man's hands clenching the sheets of the bed tightly in his grasp. Not yet, baby. I'm way bigger than this, he admonished him before slowly pressing in a third finger. He thrust his fingers inside, turning them gently and finding the mass of nerves that was the other man's prostate. He pressed on the button and felt Richard's hips thrust up, a small yelp leaving his throat. Oh yeah, baby, just like that. Let me hear you. His voice rumbled from his chest, and focusing on that spot he thrust his fingers in faster and deeper pressing in a fourth finger when he felt the muscles surrounding his mate's entrance loosen. No longer able to hold himself back, he pulled out his fingers and, coating his aching erection liberally in lube, he pressed the tip of his cock to his mate's entrance and paused. Do it, Vet, now, Richard demanded, and Vet had to stop himself from thrusting in at that point. You understand that when I do this, I'm going to bite you at some point, mark you as mine forever. You're going to belong to me and I'm going to belong to you, made it forever. I won't ever let you go after this, Richard, he stated firmly. He watched Richard's eyes open and let those crystal blue eyes lock with his clear green ones. After a few seconds, he saw Richard nod, and he smiled. I understand that. Now will you please shut the fuck up and mate me already? Richard's words ended in a gasp, when Vet pressed in slowly, stopping with just the head of his cock inside, allowing the smaller man to adjust and relax before pressing all the way inside. Both men groaned and Richard locked his legs around Vet's waist and nodded his head, telling the other man he could move. So move is exactly what Vet did. Pulling out until only the tip of his cock remained inside, he pressed back in, fully and deeply. He pulled back and then thrust back in slowly before building up speed until he was pounding his cock into the smaller man's entrance, the only sounds in the room moans, pants, and flesh slapping against flesh, the most beautiful sound that Vet had ever heard. He felt Richard's muscles clench his cock and knew that his mate was about to come. Moving his hands from where they rested on the bed, he slid them under the smaller man's back and lifted him up until his mate's neck was bared to him. Feeling his own orgasm rushing over him, he growled loudly, fiercely and possessively, Mine! and buried his teeth in his mate's neck. He heard Richard scream out with the force of his orgasm, his seed spurting up between them before he felt as if the top of his own erection flew off as he spilled his own cum deep within the channels of his mate's ass, covering them in his fluids, marking him inside as his teeth marked him outside. He felt their souls joining together their mating links snapping into place and their hearts beating as one, and felt peace flood his spirit even as he felt both the force of his own orgasm as well as Richard's rush over him. Still shaking from the intensity of their shared orgasm, Vet laid Richard back down on the bed, withdrawing his canines before licking the wounds closed and whining happily at the sight of his mark on his mate's neck. He stayed buried within the smaller man until he felt his body return to normal his hair slowly fading away, leaving only the hair on his chest, his canines receding and his cock softening and returning to its normal size before he was able to pull out. Both men hissed at the motion and Vet stood up from the bed on shaky legs and walked into the large ensuite bathroom to wet a washcloth and grab a towel to clean them both off. Having wiped them both clean and then drying them with the towel, he tossed both items toward the bathroom before climbing into bed behind his new mate. He pulled the smaller man into his arms, breathing in his new scent, which was a blend of the both of them, and smelled in delight. Things had gone much better than he could have hoped for. He had his mate, they were going to raise his sister's children together, and his pack and his ranch were flourishing. Everything was perfect. Nothing could go wrong. You know, you're cleaning up that mess when we wake up, he heard Richard mumble, and he chuckled softly. 
it seemed as if his little mate was a neat freak. Well, he was a slob, so he could see a lot of fun arguments ahead. Yes, dear. He would promise his mate anything as long as he stayed in his arms. He sighed again, his body slowly following his mate into sleep. Yep. Perfect. The only reason a New Yorker would be up at 6 a.m. is because they are just getting in from the club the night before. Other than that, the day begins 30 minutes before it's time to go to work. Richard Rich T. Tilson Chapter 6 When Richard opened his eyes, he was slightly disoriented for a few minutes. Where the hell was he? Suddenly, the past 24 hours came rushing back to his mind with sudden clarity. Vernon Vett Tate, his deceased best friend's older brother, had found him and, after saving his life, had informed him that he had partial custody of Al's triplets. They had met a great couple in an elevator at the hotel. He'd met the triplets and instantly fallen in love. They'd been miserable on the plane ride back to Texas. Arriving late in the afternoon, they'd put the triplets down to sleep, and then... His eyes snapped open from where they had slowly drifted closed. Vett had told him that he was a wolf shifter had partially shifted in front of him they'd had sex and he'd asked vet to mate him then the other man the wolf had bitten him he did a mental check of his body his ass was sore from the ploughing he'd received from vet's huge cock his neck was tender from the bite but there was something else off he felt a pressure in his head not like a headache but like another presence another person was in his head Okay, he had officially fallen off his rocker. He'd gone crazy. Maybe he had actually been hit by that car, and he was now in a hospital room, because in all of those gay paranormal romance books he'd read, none of the other men had ever freaked out like he was about to. Calm down, baby. I know it's going to take some getting used to, but I would never hurt you. And you're not crazy. you just kind of been made aware that the world isn't what you were taught to believe it was that it's bigger and more complicated than you can imagine. Now, will you please stop freaking out? Because if and I bring these babies in that room and they smell your anxiety and fear, it's going to set them off. He heard Vet say in his head, and he gasped. Sitting up quickly in bed, he looked around. Vet wasn't in the room with him, no one was there, and lifting up the sheet he saw that someone, Vet most likely, had put him in a pair of his pajama pants. He looked at the door and saw the doorknob turning. Trying to calm his racing heartbeat, he inhaled and exhaled deeply. He could do this. He was fine, and everything was okay. If Vet wanted to eat him, he would have done it last night. He heard Vet snort just before the door opened. You think I want to eat you? He heard the big Texan's voice as he pushed in Kurt, RJ, and Amy in their stroller, all three babies wide awake and smiling at the appearance of Richard. Hey, no making fun of the human. I'm still trying to wrap my head around this he admonished the other man before leaning over to lift out Amy, who had begun to fuss. Tickling her lightly, he looked up shyly at Vet, where the other man stood staring down at him. So now what? he asked mentally, hoping the other man received the question. He was unsure he would, since he'd done it consciously instead of the other times when it just seemed as if the older man knew what he was thinking. Whatever you want. I've got to meet with my beta, that's my second in command, and a few of my gammas, but that's me. You can take the triplets and go shopping, or garden, or read in the library, or watch TV, whatever you want. That responded without hesitation through their mental link. Richard was about to protest the idea of being a kept man, like he was some house husband, when he looked down into the sweet, smiling face of baby Amy. He could have his own pursuits in between caring for the triplets. I'm not a house husband, he protested stubbornly, and heard Vet snort. Of course you're not. You're the mate of the Alpha. Trust me, you're going to be working hard in no time, the other man said before walking over to place a gentle kiss on the top of Richard's head. Richard smiled and lifted his head for a kiss. Okay, so he was going to spend the rest of his life with a man who could shift into a wolf. That wasn't necessarily a bad thing, right? From what he could see, Vet was loyal, upstanding, strong, had a great sense of humor, was possessive, but not overly so caring, compassionate, a great brother, a fantastic uncle, a wonderful father, and an amazing lover. He could do a lot worse. And as their kiss deepened, he amended his earlier statement to add another great trait, impossibly amazing kisser. Oh yeah, he could do a whole lot worse.
Hours later found Richard and the triplets in one of the empty bedrooms, music playing, all of the furniture pushed to one side, the triplets all watching Richard from their baby swings as he danced gracefully around the room. The music was a fluid, pulsing beat, emotionally stirring, and when Vet found them he found himself wanting to lie on the floor and just watch as Richard moved around the room. The man truly was amazing. Vet sat down right inside of the doorway, not wanting to get in Richard's way, but not wanting to miss anything either. As Richard's legs and arms extended and his body spun in graceful circles, before sliding and leaping beautifully, Vet felt a warm feeling spread throughout his chest. His mate was amazing. He hadn't seen any type of professional dancing. Usually the only type of dancing he saw was in one of the honky-tonk bars in town or one of the gay bars in Dallas. What Richard was doing, however, it was more than dancing. Vet felt like he was actually seeing the music, the story, and he was watching passion, heartache, pain, redemption, and forgiveness in motion. He was breathless and in awe at the abandon with which his mate danced, and he felt himself growing erect behind the zipper of his jeans. As the music faded away, he saw Richard give one final turn, and with a small leap land right in front of him, his hand outstretched towards his face. The music ended, another song starting, and still the two of them remained frozen, their eyes locked on each other. Richard's hand still stretched out towards Vet's face. Without thought, Vet took Richard's hand and pulled the smaller man into his lap before taking his lips with his own and kissing him deeply, trying to convey with his kiss how watching Richard dance had made him feel. Pulling back from the kiss, Vet smiled down into his mate's flushed face. You dance beautifully, he breathed across the other man's face. Thank you, Richard breathed back. No other words were needed, and so Vet kissed his mate again, this time plunging his tongue inside the smaller man's open mouth. He heard Richard groan and growled in response. Their passion, always simmering beneath the surface, began to boil out of control. Someone clearing their voice in the hallway was the only thing to snap them out of their passionate haze. Richard pulled back with a gasp and turned to look at who had intruded on their intimate moment. Vet didn't need to look. He'd know that scent anywhere. And it was his beta, Anton Forrester, affectionately called Tun by all who knew him. Sorry to interrupt, Alpha, but you wanted me to let you know when those three new horses you had bought arrived, the large man stated, and with a sigh, Vet turned to look at him. Tun stood a few inches taller than his own six foot seven inches, and was about twenty pounds heavier, making him the perfect beta for the Tate clan, a clan made up of mostly alternative lifestyle families and individuals here in Wichita Falls, Texas. I could always take care of it for you, Alpha, if you want. He could hear as well as smell Tun's amusement at the fact that he'd caught his Alpha and his mate in a semi-compromising position. Well, if you could do it yourself, then why did you come and bother Vet? Richard asked, annoyed. Vet grinned with pride when he saw Tun bare his neck instantly and lower his eyes in submission. Forgive me, Alpha mate, it won't happen again. Tun was instantly contrite, and even though Vet knew Richard didn't fully understand Tun's reaction to him, the smaller man seemed to take it all in stride. Nodding his head, he gestured with his hand for Tun to raise his head. It's nothing, just don't do it again. What's your name? Richard asked, and Vet sat back against the doorframe, his legs spread wide on either side of the doorway. He pulled Richard around to settle him back against his chest and wrapped his arms around his mate's torso and waist. My name's Anton Forrester, Alpha Mate, but most folks round these parts just call me Tun because of my size, Tun responded. Vet heard Richard scoff at the nickname and smiled. You could take the boy out of New York, but you couldn't take New York out of the boy, and it was obviously going to take his mate some time to get used to the way those in the South like to give everyone a nickname. He'd have one before long, and he probably wouldn't like it. Well, Anton, are you mated? Do you have a mate yet? Richard asked his head tilting slightly in a move of curiosity, unaware that he was showing submission to Tun. Vet slowly and gently straightened the other man's head, thankful that he could trust Tun to not attempt to challenge Richard for his show of submission. He knew he'd have to explain things to Richard later, preferably when they were alone, because the only person that his mate should be submitting to was him, hopefully with a pair of handcuffs and a blindfold. Not yet, Alpha Mate. Tun responded, and Vet felt more than heard Richard chuckle. Please, call me Richard, I'm begging you. Alpha made is a mouthful, he pointed out, smiling when Tun nodded. 
Now then, we have got to find you a mate, and soon, so you'll know how it feels whenever you're near them. How do you feel about cross-dressers? Chapter 7 After hanging up with his friend Tommy, Richard grinned and gave a happy sigh. He hadn't seen Tommy since he returned from Europe, and he'd missed his friend who looked better as a woman than he ever would as a man. He was perfect for the large wolf shifter, Anton. Shoving his cell phone into the back pocket of his jeans, he grabbed the handles on the stroller holding the triplets and made his way towards the back door. He wanted to check out the greenhouse and the vegetable garden. He was even thinking about making dinner for his mate and his mate's friends. His mate? The words were still strange to say. He hadn't held out much hope that he would ever have anyone to call his own, or that he would ever belong to anyone himself. It wasn't because he was gay. He knew a lot of gay couples that were happy. No, his disbelief in a happily ever after for himself had more to do with the damage inside than any sort of outside influences. He sighed as he thought about his childhood, his mind going back to the day that his mother died, the same day that he'd come out to his parents. He'd walked into the kitchen where his parents had been sitting, the two of them laughing as they read the paper and asked to talk to them. He'd watched his father's eyes harden and his mother's jaw drop open in shock as he told him that he was gay, and that while he hoped to be married some day and have children, he was pretty sure that it wouldn't happen the way that they expected it to. His father's face had turned red. His mother had begun crying. He hadn't known what else to do except cry with her as he apologized for being gay, for being a failure, for not being the son that they wanted him to be. When neither of them had denied his words, he'd felt his heart break for the first time. When his mother grabbed her chest and collapsed to the floor, dead before the paramedics could get there, his heart had broken again. And when the guy that he'd been secretly dating dumped him months later because for him it was just experimenting, he'd felt his heart shatter. He hadn't been the same since. He knew it, his family knew it, and they felt that it was justified. It was his announcement, his lifestyle, that had killed his mother, her heart breaking because she couldn't take the idea of having a fag for a son as his father and brothers repeatedly told him. He had thrown himself into dancing, determined to be the best dancer that ever lived, since he could never be the best son that ever lived. He had decided that he would never allow himself to get close enough to another person that he allowed them to shatter what remained of his heart. He had barely escaped with his spirit intact, much less his soul. He needed both to survive. His heart was a small price to pay to have them. Opening the sliding door to the backyard, he pulled on his sunglasses, the wide straw hat that Vet had given to him, along with the garden gloves that he pulled on and looked down at himself. He snorted. What a picture he made, with his designer boots, designer jeans, soft cotton blue t-shirt that clung to his lean frame and cost him two hundred dollars, and his Gucci shades, whose cost he shuddered to think about. Then there was the straw hat and the gloves, both of which had maybe cost Vet ten dollars, from Walmart. Who actually shopped there if they could afford to shop elsewhere? Richard cringed when he realized that he sounded a bit like a New York snob. Then he shrugged. He was a New York snob, sort of. Hearing the chattering of the triplets, he remembered what he was supposed to be doing and stepped out onto the back porch backwards, pulling the stroller with him gently. When he turned, he was happy to see that there was a ramp down one side of the porch, and turning the stroller in that direction, he headed that way. He looked around the land that he now lived on and felt his heart pounding in his chest. He had done most of his growing up in the Bronx with his godmother and god-aunt after he left home at sixteen, some woman that his godmother had sex with whenever she wasn't having sex with this John or that John. He'd grown up knowing that his godmother, his mother's adopted sister and best friend, was a drug-addicted, prostituting lesbian. He hadn't cared, or at least that's what he'd told the kids at his school when they'd teased him about it. When he'd gotten older, he'd cared even less when the guys in the class started being the ones who were paying to sleep with his godmother. When she overdosed, he'd been a little relieved and a lot alone. With only one year left until graduation, he'd lied and told his school that his father had let him return home and was taking care of him. That was the year he'd started dancing in strip clubs for money. He'd kept stripping and dancing for money all through college, but he'd gotten a full-ride scholarship, so the money he made in the clubs he'd used for nice clothes, dildos, shoes, dildos, mani petties, dildos, hairstyles, dildos, and more sex toys than any one gay man really ever needed. 
He'd met Amanda Lynn, and she'd seen right through his wall of bullshit. The two of them had been inseparable, and she'd been the only person that had ever truly loved him. Then she'd died also. He looked up from where he crouched next to a tomato plant and found his eyes connecting with Vet's where the other man stood watching him from beside the barn. Now he had Vet and Al's triplets. Maybe he would finally get to have a happy ending, people that would love him forever and wouldn't die any time soon. His thoughts were cut off abruptly when a pair of boots came into his line of vision. He looked up a pair of muscled legs encased in a pair of form-fitting wranglers and up a wide barrel chest, square jaw, thin lips, a nose with a bump in the middle, showing that it had been broken at least once before, to a pair of gray eyes, wide forehead and wavy blonde hair that brushed the gorgeous man's collar of his checkered shirt. So I hear your name's Richard and you're the Alpha's new mate and the guardian of Mandy's babies, the stranger stated his voice deceptively nice, but Richard could hear the disgust underlying the pleasant words. He just wasn't sure if the disgust was aimed at him or Vet. He stood up and pulled off the gloves, his basket full of carrots, cabbage, tomatoes, peas, green beans, lettuce, and amazingly, beets, all but forgotten. Brushing off his hands on his pants, cringing at the sight of the dirt that had still managed to get underneath his manicure, he held out his hand to the unknown man. That's right, and you are? he asked pleasantly, aware of the sounds of whining coming from the triplets as if they were upset by the stranger's presence. Name's Bobby Ray. I'm one of the farmhands here, and I'm the Alpha's right-hand man, Bobby Ray said, puffing his chest out in pride. I thought Vet's right-hand man was Anton, Richard asked in confusion, shocked when Bobby Ray's voice turned almost purple in rage. That big dumb moose, he's a fairy just like you. Bobby Ray stated, and Richard realized then that that show of earlier disgust had most definitely been aimed at him. Well, your alpha's gay, so does that make him a fairy as well? Richard asked with an exaggerated lilt to his voice, just to piss off the homophobic asshole. He stood his ground when the larger man stepped dangerously close to him, a growl emanating from his chest. Now, you listen up, you... But, monkey, my alpha ain't a fucking fairy like you. I don't rightly know what you did when he went up to find you up there in new fucking York queer city, but I'm gonna do all I can to change him back, and either you get booted off this land along with that shitpacker Anton, or I'm going to see you both dead. We hang guys like you here in Texas, Bobby Ray threatened, and Richard felt his face flush with anger and dread. Before he could open his mouth, he heard a low, menacing growl coming from behind Bobby Ray and saw the biggest black wolf he'd ever seen standing feet away from the both of them. I want you to get your basket and the triplets and go in the house. Don't come out until I tell you it's okay. He heard Vet's voice in his head. Was that big black wolf Vet? Vet? he questioned mentally. Don't ask questions, baby. Just do what I said. No one threatens my mate and gets away with it. I'm going to take care of this little asshole. Uh, Alpha Tate, I was just introducing m myself to your mate. Richard heard Bobby Ray stammering, and as he picked up his basket of vegetables and pushed the triplets back towards the house, he almost felt sorry for the man. Almost. He heard Vet's growl grow louder and sped up, almost running as he pushed the triplets towards the safety of the house. He wanted Bobby Ray scared, yes, because he'd practically scared the piss out of him with all of his we-hang-guys-like-you talk, but he didn't want Vet to kill him. Then he'd be no better than the homophobe. Everyone was entitled to their opinions, their beliefs, and their right to live. As he shut the sliding door, he heard the sound of a second wolf and wondered what was happening, but not enough to turn around and look. He pushed the triplets into the kitchen, and after placing the basket on the counter, he placed each baby in their high chair gave them each a handful of the small chunks of peaches he'd cut up earlier, and began to wash the vegetables, getting them ready for the stew he planned on making. He would put what was happening outside out of his mind. He had to. Vet couldn't remember ever being as mad as he was at that moment. He circled around the blonde wolf. Bobby Ray had shifted when his attention had strayed a bit to make sure that Richard and the triplets had gotten inside okay, but that was fine. Vet was easily twice as big as him. The smaller wolf was no match for his daunting size. Besides, he had a huge motive to stay unharmed and to win. His mate. His heart had nearly stopped when Richard's fear had reached him through their mental link. 
He'd only seen Richard talking with Bobby Ray, but he knew that whatever the other man was saying, it was causing his mate undue stress. Without a thought, he'd stripped and shifted, making his way up behind Bobby Ray quickly and quietly. He'd gotten there just in time to hear Bobby Ray tell Richard that they hung guys like him. And all he'd known was rage. He'd wanted to tear the little bigot limb from limb, but he didn't want Richard or the babies to see. But now they were in the house and he could take care of the little shit alone. He was going to enjoy doing it. Bobby Ray hadn't made it a secret how he felt about Tun, Ross, or any of the other gay male shifters that were in the pack, or mates of one of the pack members. Vet had, for the most part, let a lot of the bigots' snide remarks slide, thinking that it was his youth and the fact that he was raised in the South, in the Bible Belt that really attributed to his narrow-mindedness. But that was not the case. Bobby Ray was a homophobic asshole, and, just like with most homophobes, he had to put him in his place, either through education and enlightenment, debate, a punch in the face, or a cock in his ass. Vet had no plans on fucking this particular wolf, not with Richard waiting for him inside. Education, enlightenment, and debate hadn't worked, so all that was left was a punch in his face. Seeing as how they were in wolf form, however, he was going to have to do one better. He was going to wolf him into submission. He chuckled mentally at the thought and heard Richard's answering groan. Sending an image of him kissing the younger man after he'd effectively beat Bobby Ray in this blatant challenge, he put up mental barriers to their link so that he could concentrate on the task at hand. He growled low in his throat, taking a menacing step towards the other wolf, giving him plenty of time to back down and show submission. When the other wolf did no such thing, he gave up being cordial and pounced. The two wolves growled, baring teeth, grappling, trying to find a point of weakness on the other. He howled when he felt the other wolf's teeth bite his shoulder, and no longer trying to merely maim his opponent, he was now going for the kill. He turned and latched onto a paw with his massive teeth, biting down hard until he heard the bone snap, the other wolf howling in pain. Before he could go for the throat, however, the sound of pounding footsteps reached his ears. He turned his head for a moment, and when he swung his head back, the other wolf had already taken off for the edge of the property. He shifted back, not as quickly as before, his injury slowing him down. But once he was human again, he placed his clenching fists on his naked hips and yelled towards Bobby Ray as loud as possible. You threatened the mate of the Alpha, and you ran during a challenge like the coward you are. I want you off my land and out of my pack, you asshole. He scowled when he heard the sound of squealing tires and knew that they belonged to Bobby Ray. The little shit didn't even have the balls to respond. Turning back to the men who stood there, all of them tense with the urge to protect their Alpha and the Alpha's mate and children, he grinned. Don't worry, boys, I took care of him. But Bobby Ray's been banished. He's not to step foot back on this property, you hear? I mean it. If you see him, let me know. I'm not done with that asshole yet. He admonished all of them, before turning to walk slowly towards the house, not caring about his nudity. He was going in the house to check on his mate and their babies, shower, and then have his still slightly damaged shoulder bandaged and cared for. He rolled his shoulders and hissed at the pain. It would probably take him a few more shifts before he was better, while in his human form almost any injury that he sustained could be healed with just one shift. If he was in his wolf form, it took two or three shifts to heal any injury. He opened the sliding door and stepped inside. He heard the clatter of silverware and the sound of Richard's running feet. He braced his feet and opened his arms for the smaller man, who launched himself into his arms. What happened? Are you okay? Did you kill him? I hope you didn't kill him. Was that him I heard driving away all fast? Are you bleeding? Oh my gosh, you're bleeding! Can't shifters heal from that? Go take a shower and clean that thing and I'll come back and I'll put a bandage on it and wrap it for you. I'm so glad you're okay. I was so worried about you. Richard spoke rapidly, and Vet blinked his eyes at the verbal assault. He merely smiled in the face of his mate's concern, and with a deep kiss on his lips, turned to walk upstairs to shower and change, so he could come back and be taken care of. Oh yeah, this being mated thing was turning out rather well. Chapter 8 Richard took a deep breath and tried to still his racing heart. Vet was okay. He'd just come through the door, unassisted, he was able to walk up the stairs, and he wasn't leaving a trail of blood, so he was okay. He tried to reassure himself with those thoughts, trying not to think of the large wound on his mate's bare shoulder, trying not to think of the fact that Vet was injured because of him. He'd almost been killed because he'd mated him. Richard, a fag, a fairy, it was all his fault. 
Richard jumped slightly when Vet's voice burst through his mind, sounding angry and exasperated. It wasn't your fault. None of this was your fault. You didn't turn me gay, baby. I've always been that way. Bobby Ray did this. It's his fault, not yours. Besides, fate knew that you were the perfect man for me, the perfect person for me. You belong to me. Even if you had been a woman, Bobby Ray would have found fault with you. Now, why don't you stop fretting over something that ain't your fault and come scrub my back? Richard felt his mate's peace and assurance wash over him, and he breathed a sigh of relief. He looked over at the playpen where the triplets slept peacefully, and turning on the baby monitors and checking to make sure that the doors were locked, he walked upstairs to join his mate in the shower. He walked into the steamy bathroom and saw the silhouette of his mate through the glass of the shower door. Richard's mind filled with images of being soapy and Vet pressing him up against the wall as he fucked him. The image then shifted and changed to one of Vet on his knees sucking Richard's hard cock. He groaned audibly as his mind was assailed with the sensual imagery, his hands furiously pulling off his clothes and tossing them haphazardly towards the hamper in the corner. If you get in here faster, I might just eat your ass before I fuck you, Vet promised, and Richard grabbed the base of his cock and squeezed it firmly, holding back his encroaching orgasm. Breathing in deeply and exhaling after a long moment, he stepped to the door of the shower and opened it before stepping inside. His mouth went dry instantly at the sight that awaited him. Vet stood in the middle of the four-shower-head shower, his cock hard, the head a deep purple color, looking almost painful. He was covered from his shoulders down to his ankles in soap, and he held a bottle of waterproof lube in his hand. Richard swallowed thickly and felt his cockhead weeping with precom. He heard Vet growl and looked up at the other man. You have no idea how beautiful you look, do you? Standing there, wet and hard, aroused to the point that you're shaking, and it's all for me. It's all because you want me. Vet stated in a rough voice before hauling Richard into his arms. Placing his hands underneath the smaller man's ass, he lifted him and then pressed him against the shower wall. Do you want me to fuck you against the wall or something else? Vet asked. Richard bit his lip before he stated boldly, I want to ride you, and then when I'm jacking off with you inside of me, I want you to open your mouth so I can shoot my load down your throat. Vet groaned and put Richard down on his feet before laying down on the floor of the shower, his erect dick standing straight up at attention. Richard looked down at his mate and watched as the other man began to slowly stroke his hard shaft. He felt his body shiver with unconcealed delight and desire and lowered himself to his knees. Pouring the lube over the fingers of one hand, he reached behind his balls and slowly pressed one finger deeply within his ass. Moaning at the sight of his mate still stroking his hard cock as he watched him, Richard knew that he wouldn't be able to last much longer, and with that thought in mind he pressed another finger inside of his velvet heat, right alongside the other. Two fingers soon became three, and he heard Vet's groan join his own. Pulling his fingers from his ass, he grabbed the base of Vet's weeping cock and placed the head at his entrance. Locking his eyes with that of his mates, the water streaming down on top of them, he breathed out and pushed down on the head of his mate's cock. He felt the muscles in his groin clench as the head of Vet's cock popped inside of him, and then he slowly, inch by blessed inch, sank down further and further on the other man's hips, until Vet's balls rested underneath the plump fullness of his ass. Move, baby. Do something. Don't just sit there. Ah! Vet complained after a few moments of Richard not moving, impatient for his lover, only to groan loudly when Richard lifted his ass just a fraction before slamming back down. Richard didn't want soft lovemaking at that moment. He had almost lost his mate. He wanted to ride him until neither one of them could walk. He wanted Vet to fuck him stupid. He wanted Vet to fuck him until that fear was gone. That heart-gripping, bone-crushing fear that filled his veins with ice and stole his last breath from him. He needed to feel that Vet was alive. He needed to know that the other man wouldn't leave him. He needed to know that Vet would be around to accept the intensely deep and eternal emotion that Richard felt inside. He needed his mate. Vet's thrusts sped up as he tried to give his mate exactly what he needed, and Richard began to pant and groan alongside the bigger man as he felt his orgasm approaching him like a passenger train. Richard leaned forward on both hands and began to lift and lower his hips in rhythm to Vet's thrusts, the water from the shower mixing with their sweat and making the sounds of flesh slapping against flesh sound that much louder. 
Their harsh breaths echoed in the room, and Richard felt his head spinning. His heart began pounding in his chest furiously, and he felt it. The tingling feeling began in his toes, and Richard arched his feet as he tried to hold off coming. He wanted Vet to come with him. He needed him to. I'm going to come, love, Vet groaned, and with that one word, that term of endearment, Richard threw back his head and screamed out his orgasm. Vet followed him over the precipice shortly after, and Richard coughed after a few seconds as he choked on the water coming out of the shower head. He heard Vet laugh, and he opened his eyes and gave him a mock glare. Yeah, in those romance books you love to read and those pornos you like to watch, the main character doesn't choke on the shower water, huh? Or have to be helped up from the floor, his back covered in bruises because of all the fucking on the floor. Vet teased him, and Richard rolled his eyes. Shut up, dog boy, Richard teased back with a teasing grin. He saw Vet's eyes narrow even as his cock began to harden inside of him again. Both men groaned at the sensation. Okay, so here are your options. We can get out now so you can bandage my shoulder and I can go back to work. Or I can go ahead and fuck you into the shower wall like I planned to in the first place. And then you can bandage my shoulder and I can get back to work. Vet offered with a lascivious grin. Richard nodded his head as if considering Vet's offer, even as he drifted one hand up to his nipples and began to play with them and squeeze them. You make a compelling argument there, Alpha, but I choose option number two. Never let it be said that I don't make sure you're clean, Richard replied with a cheeky grin, which Vet kissed off his face, shortly before standing and setting about to carry out his teasing threat. Chapter 9 Richard waved goodbye to Vet as the older man returned back to work and took a deep breath. Gods, he felt completely worn out, but in a wonderfully delightful, walking funny for the rest of the night kind of way. He turned away from the back door and took three steps before the sound of the triplets crying reached him. Alarmed, because honestly, these were some of the most well-behaved babies he'd ever seen, he ran quickly up the stairs into the nursery. What he saw there made him pause only seconds before he raced forward with a breathless cry. One of the triplets, Richard couldn't tell which one at first glance, was hanging over the side of the bed with their arms hanging down, trying to hold on to their siblings who were dangling over the side of the bed. Richard didn't know how they'd gotten themselves into such a predicament, but he knew that it was definitely something he was going to have to talk to Vet about. You're wolf shifters, not monkey shifters. What the hell is wrong with you? He yelled out in a panic to the babies, his heart pounding in his chest. He tried to shelter his thoughts from his mate, knowing that Vet would come running if he thought something had happened to one of the babies, especially considering what had just happened, and when a few minutes passed with him desperately clutching both babies in his arms, pressing his hip into the side of the nursery bed where, he looked over quickly to identify which baby was still in the crib, Amy, his brain processed, was holding on to her brothers? He checked again, and sure enough, Amy was still in the crib, and he was holding Kurt and R.J. in his arms. "'Just like your damn mother,' he grumbled. "'You can never be like every other woman out there. You just have to be different. Don't you know that you're supposed to be the one hanging on to one of your brother's hands, screaming for dear life? Not the other way around,' Richard mumbled affectionately at the little girl, who blew him a raspberry and flopped down on her tiny baby bottom, the sound of her diaper crushing beneath her making Richard smile. She even huffed like Mandy. I'm sorry, honey, even if you are a wolf shifter, as a female, you are considered the weaker sex amongst humans. Although, if they knew what I knew, that women are devious, evil, and much stronger than us because of that very thing, they'd think twice. Besides, I had a kidney stone once, and it hurt like hell when I had to piss it out. But your mother... Richard sighed in fond remembrance of his best friend as he put both boys back into the crib alongside their sister. Your mother gave birth to the two of you. That, to me, is pretty amazing. And brave. And so strong. And she was smart, too, because she left you with your Uncle Vet. Did you know that he was my mate? You probably did, huh? Richard nodded, sitting down in the rocking chair that faced the crib and slowly rocking as he talked with the triplets. All three babies were facing him, watching him intently as if they were aware and could comprehend everything he was saying and as if they found every word out of his mouth completely fascinating. Yeah, your Uncle Vet is something else. He's pretty amazing, you know. He's kind and attentive, and he really knows how to fu- Richard's words cut off abruptly as he remembered who sat in the room with him, 
hearing his every word. He coughed nervously and cleared his throat, and he'd swear years later that R.J. smirked at him as if well aware of what his namesake had been about to say. Funnel a ditch for the cattle, Richard said with a laugh. I'm pretty sure that talking about funneling with infants is inappropriate and grounds for being arrested, a deep velvety voice said behind him, and Richard turned, fully expecting to see Vet, instead finding his eyes traveling up a long pair of legs, covered by tight wrangler jeans, a thick waist, and a broad, hard, muscled torso, a square chin, a goatee, a pair of light brown eyes, long black dreadlocks that hung below the stranger's shoulders, and a big-ass grin all wrapped up in a milk-chocolate wrapping, that let Richard know that the other man knew that he'd been scoping him out, knew that he'd seen his very impressive asset, and that he'd found Richard similarly attractive. "'My name's Howell Marshall. Alpha Vernon sent me to tell you that he might be a little late coming back. One of the mares is having a bit of a problem.' the big black man said, and Richard swallowed thickly before nodding. It wasn't so much that he was lusting after the other man, but he was appreciating him. Hard. Howell nodded before turning to walk away. He took two steps before turning back around and grinning at Richard. Wolf shifter babies are very understanding when it comes to funneling, Alpha Mate. They don't cry much in general, but when their parents are funneling— they tend to fall asleep easily. That's the reason why there are so many little cubs running around in packs, he said before chuckling heartily and walking away. With a heavy groan of embarrassment, Richard dropped his head into his hands and chuckled softly, very aware of the sound of the triplets laughing from their play crib. Chapter 10 Later on that night, Vet lay in bed waiting for his mate to return from putting the triplets to sleep. He was exhausted. He couldn't remember the last time he'd been as tired as he was right then. He yawned and settled more comfortably into the pillows behind his head. He was trying to stay up for Richard. After the fight with Bobby Ray, he'd showered with Richard, been bandaged up, had lunch and gotten right back to work, making sure that he put some of his gammas on guard should the rogue wolf decide to return. He hadn't seen his mate again until dinner, and by then the house was full of pack members and their families. It wasn't a usual occurrence, but everyone had wanted to meet the Alpha's mate, and Vet had wanted to show his little man off. He hadn't minded the looks of lustful appreciation the women and some of the men threw his mate's way. He knew his pack, or rather, they knew him. No one would dare make a move unless they wanted to deal with him. Besides, he knew his man was gorgeous. Closing his eyes, he thought about Richard's tight little body, his delicious ass, and those lips. He moaned as he felt his groin tighten. He felt like it had been forever since he'd last fucked his mate's ass, although he knew that it hadn't been. Dropping his hand to his erection, he grabbed it in his right hand, squeezing gently seconds before he yawned widely. Oh, now, I don't think I've ever seen anything like that, he heard come from the doorway. Opening his eyes, he looked over at Richard, where he stood leaning into the doorway, his chest bare, wearing only his green, pinstriped boxers. He grinned and lifted his lips a little. "'Yeah, it is pretty impressive, isn't it?' he said with a smile. "'Oh, I wasn't talking about that. I was talking about the way you were jacking off with one hand and yawning with the other. That was pretty darn impressive,' Richard said with a chuckle as he walked around to the other side of the bed and climbed in. Vet turned to look at the smaller man with a tired smile. "'I want to make love to you,' he said. Richard smiled and nodded, pulling off his boxers and getting underneath the covers. He rolled over to put his head on Vet's chest, his fingers playing with the smattering of dark curls that decorated that firmly muscled surface. "'I want you to make love to me, too,' Richard agreed with a nod. Vet groaned. Could he work up the energy it would take? Could he even make the effort?' His cock was hard and ready to go. It was just that the rest of his body felt like a used dish rag. I want to, but I'm just too tired, Vet admitted, and heard Richard chuckle. Oh, thank God, because I was totally going to fake enthusiasm, Richard said with a laugh. Both men laughed then, glad to know that while their bodies wanted each other, their minds just weren't up to the task, and that was okay with both of them. You know, it has to be about more than sex for us, or it will never work. Richard pointed out, just as he'd began to doze off. "'What?' he asked, trying to wake himself back up. 
Us. I mean, I understand about the whole wolf mating thing, but mating doesn't guarantee blissful happiness, no problems ever, and a happily ever after, regardless of what those stupid romance novels say, Richard pointed out. Right, that agreed, wondering how it was that the smaller man could still be awake at, he looked at the clock, midnight? It was midnight? He was only going to get five hours of sleep, and his mate was up talking about romance novels? Why? Why wasn't he asleep? Vet looked at Richard. The smaller man was sitting up now, his mouth moving and words were obviously coming out, but Vet was too tired to even make sense of them, and he really needed to get to sleep. He knew of only one way to achieve that. Pulling back the covers, he pushed Richard back onto the bed and gave him a deep and passionate kiss. No more talking. We'll talk later, he admonished him before letting his tongue trail down the younger man's toned chest and abs to his hard and leaking cock. Licking at the slightly salty and tangy taste that leaked from the tip of the smaller man's cock, he groaned at the taste of his mate exploding on his tongue. The smaller man had stopped talking so much, but he was still making noise, and he was still awake, and that wouldn't help with him trying to get to sleep himself. So he opened his mouth and sucked down Richard's erection, his cheeks hollowing as he sucked up, his tongue swirling around the base of the younger man's cock. His saliva dribbled from his mouth, down Richard's shaft, over his balls, down the crease and the cheeks of his ass until there was a very noticeable wet spot below him. But still, Vet did not let up. Tracing his tongue along the vein in the firm shaft, he took one finger and pressed it deep within the other man's clenching channel. He hummed in appreciation when his mate began to pump his hips, as if confused about whether to push up into his mouth or down onto his finger. So Vet allowed him to do both. Lifting his mouth away from the saliva-coated erection, Vet leaned down further to his mate's balls and sucked first one and then the other into his mouth. He ran his tongue between the two sacks to the younger man's perineum. Licking the area for a moment, one hand still stroking Richard's dick, three fingers of the other hand now thrust inside of the young man's entrance. Feeling Richard's legs tense, Vet lifted his head and stared deeply into Richard's eyes. Give me all of it, baby, every drop he demanded before lowering his mouth back over the young man's erection. At that moment, his fingers pressed into Richard's prostate, and with a loud shout of Vet's name and a chorus of yes, 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 all growing softer as he continued to speak, Richard shot his seed into his lover's mouth. With a happy moan, Vet swallowed, pulling away slightly so that he could get the full taste of the younger man on his tongue, his fingers still thrusting within him. When Richard's erection finally softened and slid from his mouth, Vet slowly slid his fingers from the other man's ass, his mouth, chin, and chest wet with saliva, and traces of semen that had escaped as he swallowed. He looked at his man and saw that he was asleep. Looking over at the clock, he saw that it was only fifteen minutes past midnight. With a sigh, he climbed from the bed and walked into the bathroom. Grabbing a washcloth and a dry towel, he quickly wet the washcloth, rubbed soap into it, and walked back to the bedroom. Gently using the washcloth on the smaller man's chest, now flaccid cock, balls, and ass, Vet cleaned his mate before drying him thoroughly. Returning to the bathroom, he set about cleaning himself off, wiping down his face, neck, chest, and hands with the washcloth. He quickly brushed his teeth, gargled with Listerine, and dried off with the towel. Placing both items in the dirty clothes hamper, he grabbed another dry towel, and turning off the lights in the bathroom, he returned to bed. Climbing back in bed alongside his now peacefully sleeping mate, he pulled the man into his arms and placed the dry towel over the wet spot that was underneath his ass. Settling back against the pillows again, he sighed as he closed his eyes to sleep, his own cock painfully erect and sadly neglected. Looking down at his mate, with his sweet smile on his sleeping face, he didn't regret the last twenty minutes at all. He ignored his cock, which called him a liar as it leaked more precum onto his stomach. Oh, shut up, he said, before falling asleep. Shifter babies are some of the quietest babies in the world. That's usually because they're up to something. Anton Tun Forrester Chapter 11 Mornings came way too fucking early in Texas. Richard yawned as he turned to walk down the stairs to the kitchen to make breakfast for his big hunky cowboy. He scratched his toned stomach as he took the first step, and then screamed when he felt two strong arms wrap around him, a hand pressed against his mouth. Don't scream or you'll wake your precious babies, 
a deep raspy voice said behind him, and Richard shivered in fear. He nodded to let the person behind him know that he understood. We're going to go downstairs now, real nice and easy like. No noise, you got me, the man said, and Richard nodded again. He wondered where Vet was and if his man was all right. Vet, are you okay? he questioned the other man through their mental link. He walked in front of the intruder down the stairs and towards the kitchen. I'm fine, why? he heard Vet respond and sighed in relief. He walked into the kitchen and attempted to think of a way to get rid of the other man. There's a man in the house. I don't know where he's taking me, but— Richard's words to his mate stopped, when the man behind him grabbed him to pull him close to his big, hard body, his thick erection pressed to his back. He's taking you into the kitchen so he can fuck you on the counter before he goes to work. He heard Vet's voice from directly behind him, and with a gasp he whirled around to stare at his mate. Vet? Unable to say anything else or to ask his mate why he was lurking around and scaring the shit out of him in the dark, he grunted when Vet lifted him up into his arms, pressing their lips together in a sensual kiss. Richard felt his eyes drift closed as passion washed over him. His eyes opened as he felt himself being seated upon a hard surface, and he realized that Vet had sat him on top of the kitchen counter. He smiled at the look of dazed passion in the other man's eyes, and with deft fingers unbuttoned the other man's red checkered shirt. So are you making up for last night? he questioned as he leaned forward to allow his lips and tongue to slowly kiss and taste the clean flavor of his mate's neck. He felt Vet nod, and knew at that moment exactly what the bigger man needed. He rubbed his lips along the tendons in the bigger man's neck over his collarbone, and with his hands pushed off his shirt. He slid his fingers up both arms, tracing and caressing the hard muscles that were obtained not from a gym, but from a day of honest hard work. The muscles in his arms, his biceps, hell, even the ones in his shoulders were so firm and hard that Richard heard himself whimper at the feel of them. He pulled Vet closer and kissed one shoulder deeply, before opening his mouth and licking the muscle there. He heard Vet groan as he continued to leave open-mouth kisses over his shoulder before moving to his biceps his arms, and down to his fingers, making sure to taste the skin there as well. Vet's harsh breathing sounded in his ear, and he felt as the larger man's hands gripped the legs of his pajama pants and balled them up into his clenched fists. He drifted his lips over to Vet's neglected shoulder and repeated his attentions there, the whole while his fingers touched and caressed Vet's face, his hair, his chest, pinching the hardened brown nipples and down to caress his firm eight-pack abs. He was in love with Vet's body. He hissed as Vet pulled him up flush against his body as he took his lips in a hard, crushing kiss, the sparse hair on his chest rubbing against him delightfully. He drifted his hands down the planes of Vet's wide and firm back, pressing himself against the man intimately. All thoughts of seducing the other man, dragging out their love-making, fleeing in the presence of the other man's desires for him. I need to be inside of you, baby. He heard Vet's voice, deep and rumbling with uncompromising need. He nodded and felt Vet frantically pull down his pajama pants before stepping between his open legs. He reached down and opened the button fly on Vet's jeans, taking special care not to bruise or injure the hardened object within them as he unzipped the pants. Damn wranglers, he grumbled, before squeaking in surprise when Vet gave him a small nip on his shoulder. What the hell? he pouted. We don't talk bad about Wrangler jeans here in the South, Vet grinned before pulling out a bottle of lube that he kept in a drawer in the kitchen. You always keep lube in the kitchen drawer? Richard asked, feeling a small twinge of jealousy that perhaps his mate had been in this position before. Vet gave him a lopsided grin. If you check, there's lube in every room except for the nursery. My sister and brother-in-law were insatiable. So are John and some of the other guys who stay here from time to time. Vet grinned before grabbing Richard's legs and pulling him until his ass hung off the edge of the granite countertop. With another smile, Vet lowered his head and spread wide the cheeks of Richard's ass. With a loud moan, Richard lay back fully onto the counter. Reaching down, he pulled his knees up towards his chest, holding onto the backs of his knees as he felt Richard's long, wide tongue licking around his puckered entrance. Fuck, is everything on you, big and long? He groaned out and heard Vet chuckle, seconds before pressing his big and long tongue deep within him. It was too much. It wasn't enough. And most of all, he wasn't anywhere close to touching what Richard really wanted him to touch. Damn it, Vet, he growled. 
his feet extending into points and stretching back as his body was racked with desire. When Vet stood to his feet, he wasn't sure whether to whine at the loss of his tongue deep within his ass or sigh with happiness that he was finally going to be filled with the cowboy's hard shaft. As he felt Vet slowly push within him, he settled for sighing. He'd bottomed and topped different times in his life before, but there was something different about feeling Vet's cock in his ass. He felt so full, not just physically, but emotionally as well. He tilted his head back as he felt Vet pull his legs over his shoulders and press deep within him. With a deep moan, Vet began to thrust into him, and Richard felt the fabric of the older man's jeans, and he whimpered in lustful need. There was something about knowing that he was completely naked, laying on the kitchen counter being fucked by Vet when the man had been unable or unwilling to wait until he was completely naked himself before thrusting his cock in his ass. He wrapped his hands behind Vet's neck and pulled his lips down to meet his own. Their tongues dueled, twisting around each other, Vet's tongue thrusting in and out of his mouth, mimicking the movements of his cock to Richard's ass. Bringing one hand down from behind his mate's neck, he grabbed his leaking cock and began to pump his erection in time with Vet's thrusts. It wasn't long before he felt the muscles in his ass tighten with his approaching orgasm and felt Vet's thrusts speed up. That's right, baby. Come for me. Cover me in your cum. Vet growled in him before licking the mating mark on his neck, and with a surprised shout, Richard felt his seed explode from the slit in the top of his cock. Oh, fuck, you're so hot, baby. He heard Vet's voice as if from a distance, and music, sort of like Lady Gaga's Edge of Glory, and he knew that this was the best orgasm he'd ever had before in his life. He felt Vet thrust once, twice, three times before coming deep in his ass, the muscles in his ass still trembling and clenching as if trying to milk Vet's cock of every drop. Shit! he heard, and with a gasp he and Vet turned to the kitchen doorway to see Anton, dressed in a pair of wranglers, brown boots, and a gray shirt that looked stretched to its limit over his wide chest, and his friend Tommy, dressed in a pair of boots, a tight pair of jeans, a green silk shirt tied in the front above his belly button, both men standing there with their mouths hanging wide open. You guys are fucking hot! If this is how cowboys do it in Texas, then I should really consider moving here, Tommy said cheekily, and Richard groaned in the face of his friend's amusement. I called you when we pulled up to make sure you were awake, Tommy teased Richard as he followed the now-dressed man around the nursery as he changed the babies. Vet had made Tun show Tommy to an empty bedroom, and the two of them had hastily gotten dressed. He'd walked funny as he hurried up the stairs to their bathroom to do some major clean-up, and to get over his embarrassment. Vet had done a quick clean-up in the half-bath next to the kitchen, before wiping down the counter with bleach. The four of them had eaten a quick breakfast of eggs, toast, and sausage, with Tommy and Tun sharing heated looks with each other and amused remarks with him and Vet. He hadn't been able to look Vet in the eyes since. I didn't realize that was my phone I heard. I thought it was something else. Richard hedged as he handed Kurt a bottle before moving to RJ's crib to change and feed him. What else could it have been? Oh, my God! You thought you heard music when you were shooting your load all over him, didn't you? Tommy squealed in delight. You are totally falling for the big cowboy, aren't you? Richard shrugged and smiled down at the gurgling baby on the table. So what if I am? We're going to be raising these babies together, and besides, we've already sort of committed to each other, sorta, he mumbled. What the hell? Richie, you just met the man. I mean, I'll give it to you. He is one sexy-ass man, and his cock is amazing. But is that enough for you to be talking forever with someone you haven't even known for two months? Tommy questioned him. Tommy had always been the voice of reason in his life, but how could he explain this to him? the whole mate's wolf shapeshifter fate thing. He could barely wrap his own mind around it. When you know, you know, Tommy. That's the only thing I can tell you. He deferred before turning to stare at the other man. Love, commitment, it's not rational. It doesn't follow a set of rules. It doesn't care about race, gender, education, time, what's rational or irrational, age. It doesn't care about the natural, the supernatural, the normal, or the paranormal. Love is just love, and when you fall in love with someone, you don't let that go because it doesn't fit in with someone else's ideas about what love looks like. If you do, you don't deserve to have it in the first place. Tommy stared at him, his eyes wide, his mouth hanging open. Richard grinned at him, his back to the doorway, as he waited for his best friend to speak. He knew that he'd shocked him. 
He'd sort of shocked himself, but he meant every word he'd said. Are you saying that you love this guy? He finally asked. That's a question I'd like the answer to as well. Vent responded from the doorway, his eyes wet with tears, and Richard realized that he must have heard the whole thing. Knowing that it was impossible for him to speak any more, he merely nodded his head in his mate's direction and tilted his head to accept the kiss the bigger man pressed upon his lips when he rushed over to him and swept him into his arms. It was the sweetest kiss he'd ever had in his life. Only thing better than a gay cowboy is a gay cowboy singing Lady Gaga. Tommy, Tammy Walks, Wilkins Chapter 12 He loved him. His mate loved him. No matter how many times Vet reminded himself of the fact that Richard loved him, each time he thought it, the idea became more unbelievable than the time before it. His mate, his man, his Richard, loved him. Vet shook his head, well aware that the big, goofy grin stayed on his face. Oh, get that smug look off your face, he heard Richard mutter as the smaller man walked past him, balancing one of the triplets on his hip. Had it really been three months since he'd heard those words? Richard had only said them once, but Vet knew that he still meant them. It was in his every touch, his every word, the way he kissed him, the way he took care of him, the way they made love. Yeah, Richard still loved him. He just had to make the smaller man say it again. What, you got a problem with me smiling? He teased the other man as they worked together to bring the triplets, the groceries, the shopping bags, the feed, the mail, the packages, the deliveries, and the rest of Richard's furniture in from outside. I got a problem with it when you're smug for no reason, Richard huffed as he dragged in a large bag of potatoes from outside. Well, why don't you ask me what I'm smug about then? Vet grinned as Richard flopped down onto the couch in the living room, smiling over at the triplets who smiled and giggled back at him. I don't care to know, Richard pouted, knowing damn well what had Vet grinning like a Cheshire cat. He did feel somewhat guilty. He hadn't immediately told Richard that he loved him when the smaller man had first said it. But he had told him since, and each time all Richard had done was smile, kiss him, and say, I know. Which he guessed was something, but it just wasn't enough. He wanted to hear his mate tell him that he loved him again. He wanted to hear it every day, for the rest of their lives together. So, have you heard from Tommy? he asked, deciding to change the subject as he came to sit next to Richard on the couch. He heard the other man sigh in sadness. Not since he tore out of here when Anton shifted in front of him. I don't even know if he's okay. He won't answer any of my phone calls, text messages, or emails. I feel like such an idiot. I really thought he'd be okay with the whole shapeshifter thing. I didn't think he'd spaz out, and the fact that he and Anton are mates? Well, that just makes me feel worse, Richard confessed. Vet felt his heart clench at the sound of his mate's sadness and guilt, and pulled the other man snug against his chest. No one blames you. Don doesn't even blame you. He's hurting because his mate left him, yes, but that's directed towards Tommy, not you. He's grateful that you gave him the opportunity to even meet his mate in the first place. Don't beat yourself up over this, baby, please. It will work out. It always does. Fate doesn't make mistakes when it comes to putting people together. Trust me. He stated firmly before he kissed the other man's temple. With a sigh, Richard nodded and then turned on the TV before snuggling into Vet's chest. His arms wrapped around his big cowboy as they lay on the couch watching some sappy movie. Gods above, where did all the good visual entertainment go? Richard moaned, and Vet snorted. What? he questioned. Visual entertainment? Why don't you just say movies, man? Vet chuckled. Ain't nobody here to try to impress with your ten-dollar words and your New York education. It's all simple folk here. Just say movies. Vet laughed as Richard's face flushed with embarrassment. That's just how I talk, Vet, Richard responded, embarrassed. Vet's eyebrows rose, and he realized that even after being mated for months, making love, raising children, running a ranch and a farm on top of being the alpha couple for the Tate Pack, there was still so much about his mate that he didn't know. I'm sorry, baby. I wasn't trying to pick on you none. Just don't want you to feel like you gotta put on airs or nothing out here, Vet reassured his mate. Richard nodded and smiled. 
Yeah, I know. And even though it doesn't seem like it, I'm more relaxed here, and have been since I got here, than I have been at any other point in my life. This is me relaxed and comfortable. Vet nodded and opened his mouth when he caught a whiff of smoke. He lifted his nose to sniff the air and smelled more than just smoke. He smelled fire, and he smelled wolves, lots of wolves, about ten different wolves, and these wolves that had no permission to be on his property. Richard, baby, I want you to listen to me. I'm going to get you and the triplets locked up safe and tight in the pantry. There's a door in there, unlocks by knocking on the wall behind the cereal boxes. It leads you into a bunker downstairs that leads into a hallway that leads you to another piece of property at the edge of the forest. I want you to wait in the pantry for two hours. If after two hours I haven't come to get you, I want you to take the triplets to the bunker in the basement. Wait there for a few more hours. If sunrise comes and I'm not there, I want you and the triplets to go to that other house. Call my friend Ross. He'll get you all to safety. He commanded his mate. Do you understand me? Richard shook his head. No, what the hell is going on, Vet? Why are you telling me this? What's happening? Vet opened his mouth to respond and smelled fifteen more wolves that had joined the ten from before, and with them he smelled one familiar wolf, and they were getting closer. Bobby Ray. He looked over at his mate, memorizing his features, caressing his face before he stood and quickly grabbed a large duffel bag. Grabbing clothes, diapers, formula, bottles, wipes, shoes, and food, he threw them all into the duffel. He grabbed the baby Bjorn and, lifting Amy into his arms, placed her inside before strapping her to Richard's chest. He rushed over and opened the special order stroller they'd gotten, the one with three seats, made especially for the triplets. Pulling back the visor on the back last seat, he put the duffel bag inside of it. He turned and saw that Richard had already picked up R.J. and was placing him into the stroller, so he grabbed Kurt and placed him in the front. Giving each baby their pacifiers, he hurried his mate and their children to the pantry. Okay, so here's what's going on. Bobby Ray is back, probably to get revenge, and he's got upwards of twenty-five other wolf shifters with him. They've already set fire to one of my buildings, probably to smoke us all out of the house so that we can attack. The other men will be waiting on me outside the back of the house, but I gotta make sure you and the kids are safe before I go out there and deal with this. I gotta save the horses and the other animals. Gotta save the members of the pack that work and live here. Most of all, I gotta make sure my family, you and our babies, are safe. So I gotta go out here and kick some ass, but I can't do that if I'm worried about you. Now you remember what I said for you to do? He questioned his mate, his words coming rapid-fire, slurring slightly as his body became poised, ready to shift at any moment. Richard swallowed thickly and nodded before lifting up on his toes and kissing him deeply. "'You just make sure you stay safe, you hear me, Vernon Tate? I love you, and I am not raising these kids on my own!' The smaller man sniffled. Vet's heart leaped in his chest. He'd said it again. Granted, he'd said it in a moment of extreme emotional distress, but he'd said it nonetheless. With a cocky grin, he nodded. I love you, too, and that right there gives me a reason to make sure I survive. Now go on, get! He pushed his mate into the pantry and heard as the smaller man settled down the triplets. Pulling his key out of his pocket, he locked the door and then ripped the clothes from his body and rushed towards his sliding door, opening the door and then shifting. He'd let Bobby Ray get away once, and he'd returned, seeking revenge. The stupid man didn't realize that he'd only returned to let Vet finish what he'd started. This time, one of them wouldn't be walking away alive, and Vet had everything to live for. Not that I'm against finding your mate. I just think that having a mate is a whole lot of trouble just to have an ass on tap. Howl, Howl, Marshall Chapter 13 Richard coughed and wiped the dirt-streaked tears from his face as he continued pushing the stroller through the well-lit bunker hallway. It had been eight hours since Vet had shoved him into their pantry. Eight hours, and he'd heard nothing from his mate. Not through their link, and the cowboy hadn't shown up to let him know that it was okay. He was supposed to leave the bunker an hour ago to make his way to the cabin at the edge of the woods and contact Vet's friend, Ross. He had been frozen in place, though, shock rippling through his body, tears flowing down his cheeks. The babies all sound asleep, and none of them aware of what had taken place. He guessed he should be thankful for that. It was a small miracle, but a miracle nonetheless. Sniffling, he paused and wiped his nose on the sleeve of the flannel shirt that he wore. It was one of Vets. He was glad that the other man had accidentally thrown some of his shirts inside, and that they all smelled like him. 
It would help him to focus when he figured out a way to save his mate. Stupid man, he muttered as he continued to push the stroller, happy that he still worked out and his legs were not tired from the mile walk he was on. Going off to fight some stupid fight with some stupid redneck? For what? Leaving these babies with me? We need you, he muttered as he kept walking. You better not be dead, stupid cowboy werewolf. He felt a sadistic thrill that he'd called Vet a werewolf when the man repeatedly told him that he was a wolf shifter and not a werewolf. You leave me alone with triplets while you go and risk your life. You're a goddamn werewolf, he hissed at his invisible mate. Looking up from where his eyes had fastened on the wheels of the stroller, he saw a ramp that led up to a door. Aware that if Vet hadn't come to him, that meant that the other man, the bigger man, the stronger man, was in mortal danger. Richard knew that he needed to take some precautions. Taking the duffel bag out of the stroller, he placed it on the floor and placed Amy in the stroller with her brothers, folding up the baby Bjorn and placing it in the pocket of the stroller seat. Pulling the stroller to the side of the ramp, out of the way in case someone charged from within, he grabbed the duffel bag in both hands and made his way up the ramp and to the door. Pulling out the key that Vet had hastily shoved in his pocket, Richard inserted the key in the lock and eased open the door, listening for any type of movement. Hearing nothing, he looked around the edge of the door and saw a dark, abandoned cabin. No furniture lay within, and all around the cabin it looked like deserted forest. With the duffel bag still clutched in his hands, he crept forward and towards the phone he saw sitting on the counter in the kitchen. This is when the villain jumps out and kills the stupid cheerleader in the movies, he thought to himself turning around quickly and seeing no one. Grabbing the phone, he saw there was only one number written on the counter in permanent marker. Dialing the number quickly, he rushed back to the doorway of the bunker, his eyes still darting around the empty room. This better be a fucking emergency, Vernon. An extremely deep and husky voice answered the phone gruffly. Um, this isn't Vet. I mean, Vernon. It's Richard, his, um, partner. I've got the triplets in his cabin at the edge of the property. Someone came by with a lot of other wolfmen and they attacked Vernon. He told me to call you from here if sunrise came and we hadn't heard from him. Richard's words were rushed and frantic. Calm down, man. I know who you are and what vet is. I'm one, too. So your vet's made Richard and you're in trouble, here the other man asked, the sound of rustling, footsteps, and three doors opening and closing sounding through the phone. Yes, this is Ross, right? Richard asked, wanting to smack himself for not asking that at the beginning of the phone call. Richard heard the sound of tires swerving on the ground and the sound of the other man's deep chuckle. Yeah, I'm Ross. Probably should have asked me that at the beginning, though, huh? He didn't let Richard reply, his voice turning gruff and commanding. Look, I want you to go back into the bunker and lock the door. When I get there, I'll come and knock on the door three times, walk away for a minute. I want you to count to sixty seconds now, and then I'll come back and knock twice and say Rio. Rio? Richard asked, his curiosity temporarily overriding his fear. Place where me and Vet came out to each other, plus we both love that movie. Ross chuckled. Now, you got what's going to happen? Richard nodded, before realizing that the other man couldn't see him. Yeah, I got it. He heard Ross sigh at the sound of fear in his voice. Just calm down, New York. Wolves can smell fear, and if you ain't in that bunker, that means that fear is surrounding you big time. We're going to get you and the little ones to safety, and then we're going to rescue Vet. How about that? Richard breathed a sigh of relief. Ross knew without being told that he was going to want to rescue his mate and had already volunteered to do so. That sounds great, man. Thanks. No problem. Now hang up the damn phone, New York. I'll be there in five minutes. Without another word, Richard hung up the cordless phone, unplugged it from the wall, grabbed the permanent marker from the counter where it sat next to the phone, and blacked out the number that was written there. He didn't want anyone to trace them to Ross. Picking up the unplugged phone and marker, he stuffed both items into the duffel and hurried back to the bunker and to the triplets. Pulling the door closed, he locked it and then raced down the ramp to the stroller. Quickly checking on the babies, he found them still sleeping. Must be nice, he muttered with an indulgent smile, praying that the babies wouldn't wake up until they got to wherever it was that they were going. Taking out the baby Bjorn, he moved Amy back to rest against his chest, the baby girl making snuffling noises in protest to being moved again and put the duffel back at the back of the stroller. Pulling the stroller back up to the door, he waited, barely breathing. A few minutes went by, and then he heard footsteps. Holding his breath, he heard three knocks on the door, and then the sound of footsteps fading away. He began counting immediately, and when he reached sixty, he heard the footsteps return, and then heard two knocks and an extremely deep, whiskey-smooth voice say, Rio. 
Unlocking the door, Richard looked up and up and up and up into the beautiful hazel eyes of an oak tree posing as a man, his mouth falling open at this man who was bigger, taller, and damn near sexier than his vet. Richard struggled to remember what it was they were doing. "'You can look at whatever you want as soon as I get you into safety there, New York,' the man impostor, Ross, said with a cocky smirk, and Richard scoffed. "'I don't want to look at anything. Just help me with my babies and let's get the hell out of here. I want to come back for vet as soon as possible,' he commanded Ross in a haughty tone, before turning to pull the stroller the rest of the way out of the bunker. The two men lifted the stroller and walked swiftly but quietly through the bare cabin through the woods away from the house, and to an open field where Richard saw Ross's large Hummer parked. "'Could you be any more ostentatious?' he muttered as they lifted the stroller into the car, babies and all, and Richard climbed in after them. "'This is so dangerous. We could get pulled over, arrested, or in a car accident because the babies aren't in car seats,' he pointed out to Ross. The bigger man said nothing, merely closed the door and walked around to the driver's side, climbed into the driver's seat, stuck the key in the ignition, started the car, and then, before taking off, caught Richard's worried gaze in the rearview mirror. "'Then I guess you better hold on to that stroller and make sure that that doesn't happen,' the large man said before whipping the Hummer around and taking off like a shot down the road, showing no mercy to the road or the passengers within his car. Richard held on to the stroller for dear life, praying the whole time that they would all get out of this alive. Five minutes later they drove on to the back of someone else's property to the back of a large house, much like Richard's home with Vet, and Ross shut off the vehicle. See, you survived, nobody's hurt, nobody's dead from riding in the car with me. Now let's get these babies in bed and then figure out how to save your idiotic mate. I don't understand the whole baby thing. Why would you want constant reminders of your own imperfections? Ross, R2, Barber. Chapter 14 Richard followed Ross through his small kitchen and into his living room, and froze. He turned around and looked again. He hadn't left Ross's house and entered the Central Intelligence Agency, but he was surrounded by screens, monitors, gadgets, cameras, robots, video cameras, and all manner of spy devices. As he looked at one screen, he saw what appeared to be the back of his home with Vet. His eyes widened as he realized that it was a live camera feed of their home. Turning very slowly, he turned to look at Ross with suspicion, stepping away from the other man, cursing the fact that he was standing so close to the triplets who still slept inside their stroller. So, how do you know Vet? he asked suspiciously as he walked closer to the stroller and began to pull the triplets away from Ross. Oh, me and Vernon go way back to preschool. We both discovered that we liked boys at the same time, lost our virginity to each other, both of us topping the other. We shifted for the first time together. Ross sighed. We've been together for a really long time. So I guess you were upset when you heard that he'd found his mate, huh? Richard asked as he continued to back away from Ross, who had his back to him. He watched as Ross's shoulders stiffened. No, not upset. Vernon and I always knew that we weren't mates. The larger man responded, his voice tight with an unidentified emotion. Richard nodded, though he was aware that the other man could not see him. So if you weren't upset that he'd found his mate, then why didn't you go help him when you looked at your monitors and you saw the huge battle he was running into? He asked quietly as he hid the triplets in their stroller around the corner of the room in the hallway. His eyes jerked up at the sound of Ross's gasp and then braced himself for the man's angry reaction. It never came. What Richard saw instead was Ross's shoulders shaking, and he wondered if the other man was laughing. He opened his mouth to rebuke the man when he heard his sob. He was shocked when Ross's hands came up to brace against the edges of the desk he stood in front of. I was fucking some closeted football player when it started. I rushed him out of the door when I heard what was going on. Hours later, I was just about to shift and go down to help when you called. I knew that Vernon would want me to help you more than he'd want me to help him, so I came to help you. A sniffle, a groan of despair, and then a growl emanated from the bigger man's direction. I don't regret helping you and the babies, but my best friend is out there somewhere, maybe hurt or worse, and I— Ross's words were cut off by the sound of rapid pounding on the door. Ross turned and sniffed the air before a big grin broke out over his face. Then again the bastard could be on the other side of the door, he stated excitedly, before rushing over to the door and swinging it wide open. Standing there, supported by Tun and Howell, was Vet, looking bruised and bloodied but alive. So wonderfully alive and to Richard he'd never seen anything better. "'Where's my mate?' 
Vet's voice rasped out moments before Richard launched himself into his mate's arms. Vet lifted his arms from Ton and Howell's shoulders and caught the smaller man in his arms, sinking to the floor and pressing his face into his hair and inhaling deeply. Richard felt his throat tighten, and his eyes burn with unshed tears. His mate was okay. He wasn't going to have to try and live without him. Everything would be okay now. So what happened? Me and the little guy were just about to come down and join the party. Ross teased, though everyone could hear the emotion in his voice. Vet growled and clutched Richard to him tighter. Well? Howell, a broad-shouldered black man with long dreads that hung down like thick black ropes to his shoulders and stormy gray eyes, said with a tilt of his lips, Seems as if Bobby Ray was a little bit upset that our Alpha is a gay man, with a gay man for a mate. So he went out and found a group of rogue wolves to try to take over the Tate back. He didn't tell the other wolves why he wanted to overthrow Vet, though. They didn't find out until after we were all fighting and biting and snarling at each other. The one of the rogue wolves heard Bobby Ray yelling about finding the Alpha's queer mate and stringing him up, and he sort of stopped fighting. He yelled out in anger and raced towards Bobby Ray and started to fight against him. Richard lifted his head from Vet's shoulder and looked at Howell in confusion. Turns out that they were rogue wolves because they were thrown out of their pack for being gay, and many of them are mates. Of the twenty-five men that came with Bobby Ray, only three of them are single, Vet said, and Rich stared at him with wide eyes. He leaned into the hand of Vet, pressed against his cheek, and closed his eyes with a purr of contentment. So the fighting pretty much stopped a few hours in, but we couldn't find Vet. Seems as though he was supposed to be beaten and kidnapped so he could be re-educated about his new role as a gamma to Bobby Ray or some nonsense, Tun rumbled. So we tied up Bobby Ray and took him with us while the rogue wolves took us to where they were supposed to meet up and start Vet's lessons. The other wolves explained what was going on and Vet was released, badly blooded and bruised. We were going to let him just kill Bobby Ray right there, but he wanted it to be honorable. So the two of them shifted and fought to the death, and well... You won. You survived. You came back to me, Richard whispered, love and gratitude that his mate had survived shining through his words. I promised you that I would, beautiful, and I always keep my promises, Vet responded before pulling his mate into a deep, loving kiss. Only one person in the world could handle my brother and my children and still come out looking fabulous on the other side. And after me, that person is Richard. Amanda Lynn Tate Epilogue Vet, get in here quick! Richard yelled, and Vet felt his heart stop in his chest before it sped up quickly. Hearing his mate's frantic voice, he slid out from underneath the sink and raced towards the living room. What happened? What's wrong? He panted out, his eyes darting around the room looking for the source of his mate's panic. When he saw nothing, he looked back at his mate and then stopped in his tracks. Richard was sitting on the floor with R.J. standing in front of him, his hands on the baby's waist. R.J. was facing Vet, his hand stretched out towards him. Watch, Daddy, look at what our baby can do, Richard said with a grin before looking at R.J. Show Daddy what you can do, R.J. Go to Daddy. Seconds later, Richard released R.J., and Vet's heart stuttered in his chest as the baby took one step, then another, then another. Tears stung his eyes, and he knelt before the little boy, his arms open as the infant stumbled into his arms. Lifting him into his arms, he clutched the baby to him tightly, tears rolling down his face. He missed his sister Mandy so much at that moment. Mandy should have been there to see her baby take his first steps. She should have been there to see them grow up, to celebrate with them when Amy had said Papa for the first time while holding Richard's face. He couldn't help feeling a little guilt, because he knew that had Mandy still been alive, he probably wouldn't have met Richard when he did, and he wouldn't trade his life with his mate for anything in the world. It had been six months since the battle with Bobby Ray. Six blissful months with the triplets. They had welcomed all twenty-five of the rogue wolves into the pack. The farm and the ranch were flourishing. Richard had started teaching dance to some of the cubs in the pack. He had also started planting and maintaining their vegetable garden and their greenhouse. Vet was extremely proud of him. The triplets were thriving, growing up quickly, learning to walk and talk, always smiling and laughing and happy, and Vet knew it was all because of his mate. 
With a final hug for R.J., he placed the little boy down on the floor and strode over to his mate. Richard stood up with a smile on his face. "'Aren't you proud, Daddy?' Richard asked. The two of them had taken to calling each other by what they wanted the triplets to call them whenever they were around. Vet thought it was a little silly. At least he did until Amy had called him Dada, and then he'd grinned like an idiot for five hours. "'I am so proud and so happy, Papa.' he responded, before taking the smaller man into his arms. You have made me the happiest man in the world. I love you more each day. Thank you. Richard blinked up at him before a wide grin split his face. I love you too, my big puppy cowboy. Richard laughed and took off running as Vet growled playfully and gave chase. I'm a wolf, not a dog, he yelled out before tossing his smaller man over his shoulder and heading towards the kitchen where he laid his mate down on the counter and showed him the difference between a puppy and a full-grown wolf-shifter. Vet had never expected to find his mate in New York, had all but given up on having children of his own, but it turned out that what he'd thought was impossible and unthinkable turned out to be the greatest thing to ever happen to him. He couldn't have asked for anything more. This has been Unthinkable, written by Victor Alexander.